Rob Moore with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Tuesday, October 12th, 2021. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Keisha Blaine, Associate Professor of History at the University of Pittsburgh. On her book, Until I Am Free, Fannie Lou Hamer's Enduring Message to America. Also on the program today, the House to vote on a debt ceiling push. Supposedly should be easy. Also on the program today, Texas Governor Abbott tries to outlaw enforcement of vaccine mandates. The DOJ on a path to the Supreme Court over the Texas abortion ban. And Donald Trump is fighting Joe Biden's easing of executive privilege. I care about the institution. <laughs> Bankers rev up their fight against a new IRS disclosure rule, which is an attempt to find tax evaders. New report, 85% of the world's population affected by human-induced climate change. Meanwhile, 2021 is on pace to set records for U.S. weather-instigated disasters. 32 countries pledged to slash methane in the run-up to the U.N. Climate Summit in Glasgow. New York City to give every public school kindergartner $100 in a college savings account. All this and more on today's Majority Report. A welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks uh, for joining us uh, with me, as uh, always, uh, Emma Vigland. Hello, Emma. Hello, Sam. How are you? I'm fine. <laughs> are you happy about the Red Sox? Yeah, we found out that Emma has been secretly uh, rooting for the Rays uh, today, and uh, she had to come in and, and concede that after the Red Sox pulled off what I think was a stunning, stunning victory yes i mean i am very passively rooting for the rays i'm a big sports fan but baseball is very far down my list trying to pay attention but the 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 hockey season does open tonight yeah um, and then next week is basketball maybe so. some extra baseball considerations and why you were rooting for the uh, rays yep hmm. <laughs> hmm. we'll get into that later in the program of course <laughs> um <laughs> This uh, this vote on the debt ceiling uh, in the House is is sort of being um, sort of submerged into another more banal bill. Um, the there is uh, there everybody seems to think this is going to pass without a problem. It'll be interesting to see. There's um, you know very small margins for these type of things, um, and uh, but it has uh, already passed in the Senate, and of course this is just a punt until December. And uh, reminder, we have, and I don't know how hard and fast it is, but it is a uh, deadline for the end of this month, October 30th, 31st, I guess it's a Sunday, um, October 30th, to uh, pass the reconciliation bill and the bipartisan infrastructure bill. We still don't know what the number is going to be for that um, for the infrastructure bill. This is the reconciliation bill, I should say. And we don't know how they're going to get to that number. Again, three point five trillion dollars over 10 years. Um, one point seven five. Front loaded to the first five years. 
but considered to be over the span of 10 years, because you can just arbitrarily choose the, the number, of course, in reconciliation, 10 years is the window in which under the the the, the rules of a reconciliation bill is which um, the cost is calculated. So if you were to take $1.75 trillion and expand that over a five-year period of time and basically challenge future Congresses to cut these programs, it is effectively the same thing as a $3.5 trillion bill over the course of 10 years, um, assuming Congress does not want to take away benefits from the American public. That's usually the way it works. And, uh, but we don't know if that's the way that they're going to do it. There's a bunch of different ways in which you can drop this number to appease uh, Joe Manchin and Kristen Cinema. at this point. We will see, hopefully in the next uh, uh, days, if not a uh, couple of weeks. Um, meanwhile, the, the uh, Republicans seem to be double down, uh, doubling down on the idea that they uh, can score points against Joe Biden and Joe Biden's numbers are uh, are sinking yes. pretty fast um, by running on a pro COVID platform. You have Greg Abbott in Texas attempting to issue an executive order, and I don't know if this can supersede a uh, a federal. It's not quite a mandate on these companies that have uh, more than a hundred employees that they either have them vaccinated or i think it's weekly tests yeah um and abbott has said there's no entity in texas that can force people to get vaccinated so in other words a company cannot say you must be vaccinated to work here it yeah. remains to be seen if that's if that you know what the the legal implications are about this, and of course there's some issues here in terms of like federal authority and state power. And Abbott just wanted to tell corporations what to do, huh? It's very odd, that's isn't it? Not a free market. Position. Not a free market position. Um, but the latest is now that there's an attempt to blame the Southwest Airlines cancellations, which appears to be just a massive uh, story of mismanagement. In August, the Southwest Airlines pilots, this is according to CNBC, um, were, uh, were suffering the, the highest uh, amount of, uh, of pilot fatigue calls which was at a record, 633 in August. October's on track to be the second worst month. But in August, I will remind everybody, because apparently people don't remember, there was no vaccine mandate. Nope. Uh, and apparently Southwest is just trying to do as many, you know, like a lot of corporations are, they're trying to get their labor to work as much as they can to make as much profit and uh, to essentially exploit them and it has caught up with them, but that's not the story that they want to tell in certain quarters. Here, I give you, ladies and gentlemen, The Five from yesterday, Fox's The Five. Something becomes more acceptable and the population falls more and more in line. And it makes you wonder, the big question is, what are we going to be like in 2022 or 2023? Yeah. Like, how much will we accept, Right. And what could we even be like in two months, Jesse? The, loves, the left's war on Christmas could continue <laughs> with delays and shortages of pilots right around the holidays. Yeah, Mayor Pete's going to have his hands full. I mean, he is, is really he in anyway? charge of that. Where is Mayor Pete if you know. have all this labor action happening right before the holidays, Christmas? Yeah. I mean, there's so many different things that's uh, fascinating here. On one hand, you've got uh, Greg Gutfield sort of um, uh, espousing the, this is an authoritarian state. Where are we going to be in a couple of years? Right. Which is shocking to hear Greg Gutfield uh, worried about this. Well, way does he find out what the, this country's been doing for the past 20 years uh, in terms of like Muslims and spying and, uh, and whatnot? Never mind, 20 years. Um, but then the idea that they are now launching the uh, war on Christmas—we're uh, not even at Thanksgiving yet. This is—they're uh, getting a jump on this, and 
they are um, making it about the left's inability to discipline labor. Yes. Um, in such a way that they should get there. Now, remember, we are a month out from when these people told us all these jobs are going to come back if we, we stop giving people the hammock of unemployment benefits. Um, and there's obviously something else going on here that they are denying, but they're out front with their narrative, and that's the way they're going to do it. Well, I mean, the war on Christmas seems like a natural way to... Uh tie into blaming organized labor for everything right you can um tie that into just like general arguments about unfettered capitalism and how uh, organized labor is a, a hamper on that but then they're also blaming vaccine mandates where the labor unions have, have explicitly said i think the southwest uh airline pilot labor union that this is not a result of any like mass walkout due to vaccine mandates but they're trying to kind of make all of this work together um the reason that southwest is canceling flights in mass is because it's southwest and it sucks <laughs> it has nothing to do with vaccine mandates they they over they overbooked and uh they basically broke their staff we need to unionize the elves there you something. go yeah that's a good point, but uh, don't. That's of course a typical leftist idea, yeah. right? In order ruin to Christmas. Ruin Christmas. All right, we got to take a quick break. Uh, when we come back, we'll be talking to Keisha Blaine, associate professor of history at the University of Pittsburgh. She's the author of "Until I Am Free: Fannie Lou Hamer's Enduring Message to America." We'll be right back after this, folks. A couple of sponsors today. One is our one of our favorites, Sunset Lake Sabade. You can find them at sunsetlakesabadet.com. A 20% off using the coupon code left is best. You've heard me talk about them many times. They've got great products. Fudge with Sabade. They got coffee. They've got tinctures. Tincture with melatonin. Uh, melatonin, sorry. Melanin. <laughs> melatonin. Uh, melatonin. They have... Um, gummies and salve and hand lotion all of their sebade is uh tested by third parties for its quality and uh breakdown of its chemical composition there is a, a tremendous amount of integrity in both their product and the way that they produce their product um, they practice uh, regenerative farming practices in conjunction with the university of vermont they use integrated pest management. That means no pesticides, organic fertilizer. Their business practices are also excellent. $15 minimum wage, mostly employee-owned company. Um, and they're also movement partners. Contributed to our uh, raising funds for Afghan refugees, as well as uh, they've donated money to uh, different uh, unions that to, to support strikes that are going on around the country. Uh, just to all, all in all, a great uh, company and a great product. You can go to sunsetlakesabade.com and get 20% off by using the coupon code left is best. Longtime fans of the show, and they chose the coupon code, and I was like, awesome. One word, left is best. Also, new sponsor today. I'm sure you know um, <laughs> it, it's getting more and more... Um, Typical, all over the world, companies are hit by ransom aware attacks. Uh, they have their valuable digital files held hostage, and they're forced to decide whether to pay cyber criminals to get them back. This is happening a lot, and we don't hear about it a lot. Ignite is the first ever file system with sophisticated ransomware detection and recovery tools fully baked in. This is how it works. Behind the scenes, Ignite gives companies with limited IT and security staff. That means if you've got a small business or a medium-sized business, it gives them the power of much larger teams. With Ignite, you'll know exactly where key documents are and who has access. Automatically detect more than 2,000 ransomware variants and flag unusual behaviors. There's no on-site hardware or software needed. Shut down comprised accounts and quickly identify excuse me, shut down compromised accounts and quickly identify and restore encrypted files. And you can do this all from a single cloud-based platform. If ransomware does sneak through, you can restore your files fast and be back up and running in hours, not days. 
you know, have to pay to have the bad guys, uh, you know, relinquish your files. With Ignite, you don't need specialized security ops team to keep up. The system is always learning and adopting, adapting to new threats. You can learn more about how Ignite can protect your business from ransomware or see why Ignite is rated number one for data security by real customers in G2 Crowd. Start your free trial today at Ignite, E-G-N-Y-T-E dot com. That's E-G-N-Y-T-E dot com. Check it out. All right, folks. Want to welcome to the program Keisha Blaine. She's an associate professor of history at the University of Pittsburgh, author of Until I Am Free, Fannie Lou Hamer's Enduring Message to America. Uh, uh, Keisha, I'm here with uh, Emma Viglin. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having yeah. me. Um, let, let's start maybe uh, sort of at the end a little bit. Um, uh, until I am free, what is, uh, tell us the, uh, the, the relevance of, of that statement, because so much of, of what you write about, um, and I think what's the case with Fannie Lou Hamer's um, life, was it was about her, her testimony and her, 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 her speech, her speechifying, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the phrase until I am free comes from a number of speeches uh, which Fannie Lou Hamer gave during the 1960s and 70s, uh, and, and, and she would use various iterations of this. Um, oftentimes she would say, you know, whether you are black or white, you are not free until I am free. Uh, or sometimes she would say nobody's free until everybody's free. Uh, and I wanted to ultimately center on this idea, which I think is so powerful and important in this particular moment. And that is the fact that we all are connected um, and, and we're certainly connected when we think about it through the national context, we, we are all members of the American polity and regardless of the differences in our background, uh, you know, differences along the lines of race, socioeconomic status, education, ability, sexuality, uh, and so on, that we have to find a way uh, to work together to build an inclusive democracy. And so I think this particular phrase is one that emphasizes unity, uh, certainly solidarity, but more so a phrase that compels us to come together to make a difference. Um, tell us um, uh, uh, about Fannie Lou Hamer. I don't think, uh, I, I, well, I mean, I think, the, you know, one of the points I think of your book is that she is not as, um, as well known as she probably should be. Uh, she came to her activism very late in her well i know very late uh, very late in in the length of her life i would say right. and, and so i mean but but tell us about her her childhood and the instances where she became sort of uh, i think more conscious of of what was going on mm -hmm. well fanny Hamer grew up um in mississippi one of the things that i emphasize in the book uh, is that she was born into a sharecropping family. She was the youngest of 20 children. Uh, and sharecropping shaped her life. Uh, sharecropping uh, was, of, as we all know, a system of exploitation that ultimately left Black people, uh, particularly in, in the U.S. South, uh, you know, in the aftermath of slavery, uh, in a system of dependency and debt. Uh, and, and Hamer spoke often about the difficulties of her childhood growing up uh, in poverty, uh, experiencing hunger. Uh, I think those early experiences certainly shaped her political activism uh, because as I explained in the book, one of the things that she tried to address specifically was poverty and hunger uh, in the state of Mississippi. Uh, and she did this in, you know, when she uh, drew, the drew the late 1960s after she had joined the civil rights movement. Uh, but it's important to situate Hamer's early life through the context of sharecropping but also through the lens of racial violence, because one of the things that Hamer recalls, uh, one of her earliest memories, in fact, uh, is uh, you know, an unfortunate incident of um, mob violence. Uh, she talks about the experiences um, of, of you know, someone in, in, in the community who had essentially been lynched, uh, lynched because he spoke up, because he asserted um, his, his right. He was making a demand that, that, um, that he be compensated for his work uh, fairly. 
Uh, and of course, that's a difficult thing to do uh, as, as a Black person living in, in the Jim Crow South. And, and so Hamer recalls this experience of, of someone by the name of Joe Pullum. Uh, and I think in those two brief examples, it's important to, to again, see how poverty and hunger shaped her, her early life, but also how the traumatic experience of, of, of racial violence also shaped her life uh, and, and then carries into her adult years. Well, it shapes her life at the start, of course. I mean, it's the entirety of her life. But something I didn't know um, was the fact that she underwent an involuntary hysterectomy like so many Black women during that time period um, by a white doctor. Can you talk about that? Because that happened towards the end of her life, um, I guess maybe in her 40s, something like that. Um, mm -hmm. Another just... <sighs> horrible uh relic and or not relic it kind of still lives on in many ways today but 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 uh part of our racial history in this country yes uh so one year before fanny lou hamer joined the civil rights movement this is 1961 she was the victim of a forced sterilization uh, and just to provide the brief context hamer uh, had been hospitalized to remove a small uterine tumor and this was a non-cancerous tumor and uh, unbeknownst to Hamer, the white doctor who performed the procedure uh, decided to remove Hamer's uterus. Uh, what, what is really, I mean, the act itself is traumatic, very shocking that it happened, but to add insult to injury, Hamer did not find out about what had taken place until after she left. She found out through gossip uh, because the doctor was related to uh, someone who worked on the plantation. And so um, actually it was related to uh, the wife of the owner of the plantation to be specific. And this individual uh, was spreading uh, the gossip about what had taken place to Hamer and she learned through the Whisper Network. And so uh, this particular experience uh, also shaped Hamer's life. Uh, you know, she didn't talk about it immediately in the public uh, sense, but she began to address it uh, in the years to follow. So once she became a, a, you know, a member of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee uh, in 1962, uh, she would go on to lead, uh, you know, a number of efforts for Black voting rights. And often in her speeches, she would talk about the forced sterilization. She would talk about it as an example um, of the, the racist practices that were taking place uh, in Mississippi, certainly, but also across the South. It, it, it became a way for her to, sh to, to shine the light on a common practice, as she pointed out. Her experience was not unique, sadly. I, I want to go back to, and we should say, um, you know, we've, we have instances of this happening to immigrant uh, um, women as recently as, uh, as months ago um, right. in this country. Um, but I want to go back uh, to uh, that, uh, the, her seeing Pullum being lynched. And we should say that was in the early 1920s, uh, 22, 23, I can't remember exactly. And it was... Um, this is the resurgence of the KKK in this country as well. I mean, we are at uh, at that time we are at peak um, resurgence of of white supremacy, having sort of like you know recovered and and, and usually through violence um, uh, any type of gains that have uh, taken place for black people in in Reconstruction, um, and uh, this is this is also just so that people have a context of this this is when you start to see most of the confederate statues going up uh sometime within five or ten years of that uh, of, of that time so where is she once she sees that violence and and she is seeing this as a um as a, i guess almost like a teenager at that point um wh where what happens between then and 30 years later when she you know, walks into a, a student, uh, a student organization that is ha that is growing during uh, civil rights and sort of becomes aware of just how dispossessed um, politically she is as a black woman. What, what happens during that that period in between? Well, many things happen. Um, I think first and foremost, Hamer's life was absolutely consumed with sharecropping. And, and she, in fact, explains that um, you know, there were days where you know, fr from sunup to sundown, I mean, it was just labor intensive, uh, working uh, tirelessly, uh, not just herself but other members of her family. You know, she also goes through several um, losses. So you know, she loses her mom, 
Um, and, 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 and then she, you know, she also, she loses her father before that, uh, you know, so, so there are all of these personal tragedies that take place. Um, and I think what is clear to Hamer by the time, by the time she gets to that SNCC meeting in 1962, um, it, it's no surprise that Mississippi is, is, is a place, um, that, it's certainly violent. I mean, we've been talking about racial violence in the, in the context of the lynching, but also Hamer sees the way that white people, not only in the plantation where she's working, but but in neighbor, you know, she's looking at other people in the community. She's seeing the way that so many white people are strategizing to keep black families um, in a particular place. Uh, and, and in fact, one of the other traumatic experiences that she talks about is her her family um, ultimately her father working very hard at one point to bring in enough resources to be able to uh, purchase his own tools and 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 the family at one moment being able to um, you know have better living arrangements and at that particular moment a neighbor poisons the livestock right as a as a way to send a clear message that this is not what you can do as a black person living in the south you you, you simply um, have to stay uh, within the bounds of white supremacy and, and what is allowed and not allowed for black people so so i think those are the kinds of experiences that she uh, endures leading up to august 1962 that i think ultimately set the stage for for why she's so captivated at that meeting uh, because she sees a way out, you know, in learning about the constitutional rights um, of Black people as citizens, citizens of the United States, it becomes a moment where she says, okay, I can do something to effectively overturn this racist system um, through the ballot, essentially. Uh, and, and I think that's a transformative moment for her, certainly, and, it, and it's one that sets her on the path uh, to the 1964 Democratic National Convention, where most people encounter Hamer for the first time. And we should say she's 40, she's 44 in 1962. What, 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 what got her into that meeting? Like, I mean, I can, I can right. understand, like, she gets into the meeting and she, she, see, she gets this sense of empowerment, but what got her into the meeting? So it's important to remember that the meeting was actually being held um, at a local church, right? And 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 as I explained in the book, Hamer was a person of faith. Um, you know, went to church uh, every Sunday. Was part of this religious community, and and so when she heard that there was going to be a specific meeting uh, on that particular day, uh, she was certainly interested, but she wasn't sure she would attend. In fact, she admits that she was a bit hesitant initially, uh, until a friend said, listen, you have to come, come and, and just listen to, to what it is these activists have to say. Uh, and so she went, you know, at the prodding of a friend and it turned out to be uh, the most important decision, you know, of her uh, political career because it sets her on this path. And, and I talk about it as both a political awakening and also to an extent a religious awakening because she saw this moment as um, a call, I mean, she saw it as a calling. It wasn't just that she was interested in, in civil rights, that she wanted to be part of the struggle um, to expand Black political rights, but she believed in that moment that it was God's um, calling for her, that it was divinely ordained for her to join the movement and, and help uh, in this larger effort. I, I mean, I, I think that the 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 lesson there, because so much of your book is also a, a way of taking events that have taken place over the past couple of years, and and um, and and basically transposing the lessons that uh, uh, Fannie Lou Hamer would, would would provide in those instances, those parallels, and the idea of of SNCC um, going to the church, you know, finding people where they are rather mm -hmm. than waiting for people to show up uh, to to them, I think is really. Um, uh, important from an activist standpoint, uh, you know, meeting people where they are, you don't know what you're going to find uh, or or who's going to find you in those instances. Um, so she she goes to this um, uh, a SNCC meeting and 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 becomes aware of the fact that the Nineteenth Amendment exists, mm -hmm. the you know the Thirteenth Amendment, Fourteenth uh, Amendment, the Fifteenth mm -hmm. Amendment, these, the that she has the right to vote. Um, then what does she do after that? I mean, she's, she's, 
sort of stuffs um, a lifetime of activism into, you know, the next 15 years. Right. Um, and so what is so powerful about that particular meeting too, you know, as we're talking about some of the parallels and the lessons we can learn, uh, is that at this August 1962 meeting, SNCC activists are asking for volunteers. Uh, so they're encouraging people to get involved in the movement from the very moment uh, that you hear about it. They're saying we're looking for volunteers of individuals who uh, are willing to try to register to vote. Uh, and this is not a light thing, you know, as, as we've been talking about the violence, we've been talking about uh, so all of these roadblocks for African Americans at this particular time, uh, Hamer quickly, quickly volunteers. And so that becomes, so, so that year, 62, becomes the very first time that she attempts to register to vote. She's not successful, uh, but, she, but she tries. Uh, and, and in that attempt, I think it becomes even more clear to her uh, the challenges ahead, uh, because she talks about certainly, uh, you know, the, the intimidation of the police. Uh, you know, she talks about uh, being given, uh, you know, a literacy test that was simply too difficult for her, uh, which was another strategy uh, that, you know, white supremacists use to, to block Black people from having access to um, the ballot box, giving these unfair literacy tests that, you know, most people couldn't even pass. Uh, and 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 Hamer talks about these experiences, and then realizes, okay, it's going to take a whole lot of effort to to break this thing because it is not simply just showing up and registering uh, in, in an easy fashion. It is encountering roadblock roadblock after roadblock simply to register, right? Simply to register to vote. You haven't actually cast, you know, you haven't actually. Uh, voting yet you're just trying to register so that you have the ability to participate in the political process and and she she understands why in this particular moment only five percent of the black population um in the 19 in the early 1960s were registered to vote right that becomes clear to hamer when she tries in that first attempt um and so she keeps she tries several times you know she joins all these efforts to lead voting rights um, workshops. Uh, she, I mean, she's she's very busy. As you point out, in 15 years, Hamer did so much that, uh, quite frankly, it's it, it's just unremarkable. Um, I mean, rather, it's remarkable um, to to imagine what someone could do in 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 such a short period of time. Uh, she was involved in so many initiatives, as I explained in the book. You know, from tackling poverty to addressing women's rights. You know, to uh, you know, even uh, just her international vision, so many things that she was concerned with. Uh, and it all starts in 62 up until uh, her passing in 77. Uh, I want to get to the aspects of her sort of, in some ways, pioneering intersectionality, uh, you know, in a non-academic form. But she, I just... I mean, she was beaten at one point uh, pretty severely um, in her attempts to register people. And we should just say, like, you know, we're talking about 60 years ago. Uh, I mean, less, really. Um, and, you know, the, I, I, I was born two or three years after the, the, you know, this moment where she starts. I mean, so this is not that long ago in our history. I'm old, but I'm not that old. And it's, I just want people to understand, uh, you know, appreciate the, how how recent the idea of attempting to register uh, voters uh, gets a 45, six year old woman beaten. Um, I mean, beaten severely. Mm -hmm. um, and we're talking about 5% of black people registered who are eligible to vote. We, we are not far from that. Um, and uh, that, I think that's important to, to keep in mind. But but talk about the, uh, since we're talking about that beating, you, you draw a parallel between what happened with Sarah Bland in, in 2015. Uh, Sandra. Sandra Bland, excuse me. Um, and, and, and what Hamer had to teach us about police brutality. Yes. Uh, you know, I mentioned initially when she attempts to register to vote for the first time, she has this encounter uh, with the police, not only um, at the courthouse, but also even traveling back. She talks about being stopped. She talks about the intimidation and, and the fear. Uh, and so when Hamer in 1963 is traveling, this time she was coming from you know, a voter registration uh, workshop uh, in South Carolina, traveling back 
home, uh, it's it's not in some ways is not surprising that she encounters um, you know police uh, violence yet again. But in this particular moment, uh, it, it it's it's simply I mean it's just egregious what took place. So Hamer, as you point out, you know had been traveling with a group of activists. They were at a rest stop. Uh, several people, you know, were using the restroom. Um, Hamer was initially on the bus when she was looking out and realizing that several of her friends were being arrested. She left the bus to, to figure out what was going on, just to inquire. And within minutes of coming off of the bus, she was brutally attacked. The police officer started kicking her, uh, grabbed her, arrested her too, and then she was taken to a Winona prison cell. Uh, and there, you know, Hamer later shared that she endured a, a brutal beating, not only at the hands of, of, of the police officers, but also she talks about the difficulties of having prisoners join in. Um, and to be clear, uh, prisoners were instructed, instructed to, to beat Hamer. So it wasn't so much of a matter of choice, right, given the, the, the context and the, the power dynamics. Um, and Hamer goes through this process. It leaves her uh, with, with a number of physical ailments. You know, Hamer had already had a limp, um, which she had developed, you know, in childhood um, after contracting polio. And, and that particular beating in 63 only exacerbated the, the limp. It left her with kidney damage. Uh, it left her with a blood clot in her eye, you know, just a, an array of physical um, ailments. But even beyond that, uh, emotional uh, one can imagine the the, the, tra the trauma that, that Hamer endured uh, in that particular context. And she also uh, didn't reveal it initially, but, but later started to share that the experience uh, was also one of sexual abuse. She spoke about um, how uh, she was touched inappropriately, uh, you know, in addition to uh, all that she had endured in terms of the, the beatings. That was another moment, another transformative moment in Hamer's life because it's, it's, it's interesting to imagine, you know, I think for some people having gone through that painful experience, they might have just walked away and, and said, you know, this is too much. Clearly, um, you know, one would understand that response. But Hamer's attitude was, how can I uh, take this painful experiences, uh, take this, uh, this painful experience and have it propel my activism further. Uh, and, of, and she addressed it the way she addressed the 1961 forced sterilization, which was tell people about it, talk about the pain, talk about the experience, um, and in so doing, obtain some amount of justice by, by shedding light on what had taken place. Uh, and, and so that's a pivotal moment uh, in Hamer's life uh, that she talks about uh, throughout the 60s. Uh, but you're absolutely right. That 63 beating was a pivotal moment for her. Uh, talk about the the 1964 speech to the DNC. Uh, this is um, when she gets some, uh, obviously, some national attention. What 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 did she say, and and what was she doing there? Uh, so several months before Hamer arrived in Atlantic City uh, in August 1964 at the Democratic National Convention, she helped to establish a group uh, called the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. Uh, and, and just to provide context, the, the Democratic Party uh, of the state of Mississippi, not unlike other Southern states at the time, uh, ultimately did not allow Black people to participate in the political process. They Hamer, were horrible racist. I mean, they absolutely, were super absolutely. racist. Super right. racist. Um, and, and Hamer uh, pointed that out. I mean, she certainly challenged that out, challenged that in the state of Mississippi before even arriving in, in Atlantic City. And tried, you know, along with several activists in, in, in SNCC, tried to bring about changes. It was clear that uh, the, the state party had no interest in including African Americans. This was an all white party. Uh, Hamer wanted the nation uh, to see, essentially, and I would even say the world to see what was happening in Mississippi. Uh, you know, we, I, I spoke earlier about the exclusion of African Americans. Um, in the broad sense, and she wanted people to recognize, look, here's a, a state party that's supposed to be representing the people of Mississippi, yet they have excluded an estimated 400, 450,000 Black people uh, residing in the state. And she called that out. That's unacceptable. It's actually anti-democratic. And she said, instead of 
seating uh, this all white party, um, ultimately seat members of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party uh, to ultimately show that in fact, this nation is committed, right, to the idea of democracy and including people um, of all backgrounds. And so she brought that, that issue to the DNC. Um, and, and this was a speech that was televised. Uh, she ultimately spoke about voter suppression. I mean, that was the, the, you know, the heart of it is talking about voter suppression and also talking about um, racial violence. Here uh, in that context, she spoke about her experiences of police brutality and intimidation. She spoke about the challenges that she endured. She spoke about attempted ass assassinations on her life. Uh, it, it was really a moment to cast a spotlight um, so that everyone would understand how difficult it was for Black people uh, in Mississippi, but also broadly in the South, uh, to, to participate in the, in the political process. And in so doing, she hoped that, um, that, that, that the National Party would, would take a stand by welcoming and, and giving uh, full recognition to the Mississippi Freedom, Freedom Democratic Party. Um, that simply did not happen. As we know, what was offered was in fact two symbolic seats um, at the convention and Tamer refused those two seats. Uh, and you know, it's, it's, it's really uh, interesting because for Hamer, that was a moment, that was a moment of disappointment. She, she, she left Atlantic City feeling very down that she had not actually accomplished what she set out to accomplish. The irony is that once she left that convention, her whole life changed because it catapulted her um, political career because people were so moved, so compelled by her testimony, even though she didn't get what she wanted. The testimony alone, I think, moved people. To this day, when you talk about the 1964 convention, hardly anyone has anything else to say but um, you know, Fannie Lou Hamer gave this remarkable speech. And and the the power of the media um, comes into play when you discuss Breonna Taylor's story and how that traveled on social media and and, um, and mirror that in terms of Hamer's th that TV, that speech on right. TV and, and her use of the media. Will you just talk a little bit about that, that parallel? Yes. Uh, one of the things that um, really surprised me, uh, and I think this is true for a lot of people, is that it was not until, um, you know, this remarkable social media campaign started uh, in, you know, so several months after the, the entire nation learned about uh, the killing of George Floyd, then um, people began to learn about Breonna Taylor. I mean, Breonna Taylor um, had been killed by police several months before, but it was not until several months you know, after George Floyd that people began to hear her name. And one of the reasons they began to hear her name was because of the efforts of uh, a young journalist by the name of Kate Young, who came up with this compelling idea uh, to start a hashtag uh, that would coincide with, with Breonna Taylor's birthday. Uh, this, was, this was a hashtag uh, that was circulated um, you know, on Twitter, also Instagram. And what that did was it brought attention to Brianna Taylor's case, but even more specifically, she used it as a strategy to get people to write letters um, to public officials to demand justice in the Brianna Taylor case. Several developments followed after this um, social media launch. Uh, and in so doing, it actually brought attention to the work of grassroots activists um, who had, had, had not you know, received too much national attention previously. So there's a way in which you know, while there is still some critique, you know, some people will, will criticize and say, well, yes, if you're tweeting, that, that that's useful, but that's not activism. Well, incorrect. What we learned through not only, um, you know, Kate Young's example, but also in talking about, you know, Fannie Lou Hamer, as you point out, the power of the media, is that it takes all of these um, tools, it takes all of these strategies to ultimately affect change, right? It's not just one or the other. It's just how do you pull all of these things together? And in this, um, and Breonna Taylor's case, it was connecting the social media activism, if you want to frame it that way, in order to bring about media, greater media, media attention, combined with the grassroots activism that was taking place. Um, you know, and and uh, ultimately, I think yes, we, we can still, I mean, you know, we we recognize that uh, the, the family still has not received. You know, I, I think um, 
full justice, I'll put it that way, for, for um, you know, the, the killing of Breonna Taylor. But I do think some important developments took place that we can credit to the, you know, the, the broad activism and, um, as I mentioned, the work of Kate Young. So in terms of Fannie Lou Hamer, though she did not leave the 1964 convention with, with um, you know, everything that she wanted, what she did was she gave this public testimony, right? And, and I should note too, a public testimony that terrified the president of the United States. You know, one of the things that happened is as Hamer was giving her testimony, President, uh, you know, Linda B. Johnson decided to hold an impromptu press conference on, on some trivial matter just to be able to divert attention away from this powerful Black woman. Uh, it, it didn't work. In the end, when people saw the speech that had been uh, recorded, it moved them just as powerfully as those who were present and, and heard Hamer speak. And that speech, I think, played a critical role in laying the groundwork for the passage of the Voting Rights Act a year later in 65. You draw some parallels too with the uh, Poor People's Campaign that's uh, taking uh, that, and and the 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 notion of poverty being a moral, not political uh, issue. And I, I'm curious about that because, like, how much class consciousness did she have? There's a lot of sort of like what we would now call intersectionality, at right. least um, uh, in 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 what she was arguing. Although I, it wasn't called that at the time, but she was acutely aware of the sort of multiplier effect of being a, um, a, a woman and being a black person and being a poor person. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but how much, how much awareness was there? I mean, how much of that, that the, the idea that there is a, a moral question to the poverty as opposed to in many respects, I mean, I, I I'm of the belief that it's, it's really, in many respects, more of a political question, right? I mean, it's like a function of choices that we're making and and disempowering people. That um, um, and but but where did how much of that sense that it was moral come from her Christianity? She was deeply uh, a Christian. She was against um, abortion and birth control. Um, we should say. Um, but how much? Like, what what was the interplay there? Like, where where was she in? Um, in that, in in seeing the political choices that made essentially poor people, as opposed to uh, it just simply being, you know, morally wrong. Well, I think she was certainly aware of the importance of shedding the light on the political choices, because when she spoke about leadership, for example, um, you know, she would always emphasize that when you look at poverty uh, in the state of Mississippi, uh, and you look at the challenges that Black people are facing, uh, she would say, you know, these are man-made problems. I mean, she would say, ultimately, um, the circumstances that people are facing uh, could change if those who are uh, elected officials, for example, made decisions differently. Uh, and and this was this was clear in the context of um, the Great Society programs. So, you know, as an example, she would say, you know, here you have all of these um, technically all of these resources that are supposed to help uh, lift people out of poverty in the United States. Yet, um, in in the state of Mississippi, and and she would talk about in in the case of Sunflower County in particular, you would have individuals who are supposed to make sure that resources are distributed among the community, among the people who are uh, in need. And they were not actually doing that. They were holding on to resources. And so as it turns out, the people who already had um, just continued to grow their wealth. They just continued to thrive um, as they watch, uh, you know, black and, and brown people uh, sink, you know, uh, fall deeper and deeper in, into debt. And so I think she was clearly mindful of the the political choices and, and how that shaped uh, the realities in, in Mississippi as is true across the nation. But I think to, you know, for her, you know, I mentioned earlier in, in, in that August 62 meeting that when she joined the movement, uh, you know, her sense that it was part of God's will, that her sense that it, it was divinely ordained, that she would be in that particular space, 
um, and that she would come to this realization um, of how she could use her voice, how she could use you know, her, her limited material resources to make the world a better place for others. I think that in a similar way, uh, she approached the issue of poverty through that lens. You know, it's drawing parallels to, you know, um, the Bible. She would all, often quote from the book of Luke. Uh, she would talk about, you know, how in, in the way that, that Jesus would, would be described as, um, as coming to set the captives free and, 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 um, and, and, and bring liberty to, to those who are uh, in chains, to those who are hungry uh, to, 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 you know, to bring sustenance and things like that. I think she drew a similar parallel to herself that she believed that um, it was important for her to do because it was part of God's will. So, so I think uh, the, the point is that she was not oblivious to um, the fact that we have to talk about poverty uh, in political terms, but I think more so for her, the religious uh, impulse guided her decision to, you know, to launch Freedom Farm, which I talk about in the late 1960s, right, to come up with an actual strategy, an actual solution to feed people who are hungry, that she felt she needed to do um, as not only a citizen of the United States, but but more so, um, one might say, um, as you know, as as someone called to do God's work, I think that's how she framed it. Which is which is exactly why I wanted to draw this parallel uh, to the Poor People's Campaign of today and the work of Reverend Barber um, and Reverend uh, Theo Harris. Well, um, why do you think that she's does it? Why why she has so little recognition in our? I mean, relatively speaking, uh, in our I don't know. A uh, popular understanding of of civil rights leaders at that time. I think there are many factors. Um, the first is that we still tend to tell male dominated narratives when it comes to the civil rights movement. Um, a lot of work has been done. Uh, certainly, lots of great books written on the role of black women in the movement. But to this very day, I think the default is always. Um, you know, quickly to talk about Martin Luther King Jr. You talk about the civil rights movement and the first thing someone wants to talk about is Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. This is not to dismiss King. He is absolutely a pivotal figure, but, but it is reflective of how we, we tend to sideline um, just an array of voices. The other thing too, uh, is that she, you know, she was a poor, you know, black woman, a disabled black woman, uh, someone, you know, with a sixth grade education uh, oftentimes, when we talk about civil rights leadership, we tend to focus on members of the Black middle class and elite. Uh, Hamer did not fit that mold. Uh, and she did not subscribe to respectability politics, right? The, the idea is that she spoke her truth, uh, didn't really matter who felt uncomfortable. She called out what she saw as problems. And she, in fact, critiqued the very same leaders who uh, today we focus on. She critiqued Martin Luther King Jr. She critiqued Baird Rustin. She critiqued uh, you know, other people who she saw as trying too much to work with the administration, uh, for her, she felt like uh, people needed to be uncompromising in their demands. And so I think for an array of reasons, including the ones I mentioned, we don't uh, remember her and we don't talk about her as much. I certainly hope my book um, will, will help to, to change that. Um, and I hope that people find it useful. That dynamic, I think, is, is fascinating because you, you do retell stories where um, she was uh, admonished. Um, right. I, I can't remember the exact quote, but I think it was the. Um, um, well, several people. <laughs> the, yeah. But uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the head of maybe it was the Mississippi NAACP mm -hmm. had. Yes. Um, I mean, that the, it. it it, it it does feel that like her her class and her education and this sense that she doesn't have any business i mean that's sort of the the the, the paradox here is that she's a i mean you 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 emphasize that she's a a, a you know a normal person i don't know how to articulate that more like a like a like a typical person particularly of that uh, of that age um yet she was pretty extraordinary in, in many respects and she was um she was not made into an icon but but uh, but 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 you know easily could have been it seems mm -hmm. i think so and that's one of the reasons why her story um resonates with me so deeply because you know when i teach about hamer uh, many of my students 
uh, in the way that I did can can really connect with her. Uh, and she almost feels like, uh, you know, a person that you might know in your community, you know, a person that you might, you know, encounter in your day to day life, which then sends the message that in order to affect change, um, any one of us could in fact make a difference, right? There's a way in which by focusing on how ordinary uh, she was, that it compels us to, to see the possibilities in ourselves, uh, you know, and those around us. Uh, and so both ordinary and extraordinary, it is a, I think a powerful lesson. Um, and, and, and I think more to the point, it's, it's a story about what happens when you give people the room um, and the, the space to lead when you, when you um, support people and you, you don't necessarily um, walk in to tell them what to tell them what to do. Like that's the power I think of Hamer's story too, how SNCC activists uh, surrounded her and gave her uh, the, the tools and the support and let her then allowed her to emerge as the, the, you know, the, the leader that, that she was. I think that's a model of like just grassroots leadership that's powerful even today. It, does she have more acclaim in, uh, I, I mean, is there a, is there a disparate amount of acclaim that she has within the black community than, than in, uh, you know, I guess uh, broadly, you know, uh, our society at large? I think so. Um, and that is often the case, you know, as someone who writes about um, so many um, black activists and intellectuals of the past, I find that to, to be the case with Hamer. But I will say too, that even among, um, even within, you know, black communities, uh, people might talk about Hamer, they might quote Hamer, you know, they, they might circulate images of Hamer, but they might not know as much about her life story. Uh, and so, so I think that's, this is partly why this, this book is, is useful for, for all readers, because even people who, who say, yeah, I've heard of Hamer. Yeah, yeah, she gave a, a speech at the 1964 convention um, the, the key is, okay, now take one step further and, and go just beyond that speech and, and learn who she was, you know, where she grew up, how she developed her ideas, um, and, the, and the widespread impact that she had far beyond the 62 speech. I think that ultimately, uh, you know, it's one thing to quote someone or mention their name or show their, show their image, and it's another to be able to talk about their ideas in concrete ways and, and, and more so how they are relevant to the present. Well, the book is uh, Until I Am Free, Fannie Lou Hamer's Enduring Message to America, uh, Keisha Blaine. We will put a link to that book at majority.fm. Thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thank you. All right, folks, going to take a, a quick break and we'll be right back after this. We were just talking the um, that um, so important to 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 know both the the history and get a sense, at least in my opinion, of 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 just how recent these sort of like the more dramatic numbers are. Let's say five percent of black people uh, could could register. We're registered sixty years ago. That is not a long time ago. And that is a lot of black people 
who are unregistered and not unregistered because they didn't want to take time because literally people are getting beaten. And there are a lot of people that want to obscure that. Yes. And, and, it, and it explains the dynamic that's going on today. Yes. Um, all that said, if you're watching us on Peacock, we will see you tomorrow. Until then, goodbye. Bye bye. Those of you sticking around, which is the vast majority of you, um, we're going to head into the fun half. I remind you, it is your memberships that allow this show to survive and thrive. You can become a member at jointhemajorityreport.com. When you do, you support the free show. We get you extra content virtually every day. I know we didn't do it yesterday. But, I mean, come on. It's a holiday. Well, yeah, like, like I, I had people going, like, what are you, what, what are you doing? Why are you doing the show? Federal holiday. But, pff, sorry, man. This is the way we roll. Yeah, well, we wanted to stick it to Columbus. Yep. Uh, <laughs> grandstanding oppression party. Uh, <laughs> uh, I am ordered my first Just Coffee order yesterday because of you, and I live 30 minutes south of Madison, Wisconsin. Why I never did this before, we will never know. Have a great day. Go visit the Just Coffee. Well, I don't know if you can do it now during COVID, but I was up there and visited the roasters there a couple of years ago. It was great. The, the Just Coffee, such a cool, it's a co-op. They are the other, when I think of the two movement sort of advertisers that we've had over the years, it's, it's these two. Um, were it not for Just Coffee, Things would have gotten very ugly with that whole Cernovich thing. Uh, they were the only advertiser who, you know, like I had some type of like other relationship with. Wow. Who emailed and said, ah, we got this dodgy email from some what appears to be fake organization, Oof. you know, uh, about uh, child rape or something saying that uh, you, you, you should be, um, we shouldn't support you anymore. And I just wanted you to know. They can go f themselves. They're fake, and 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 that is when I became aware of everything. Contacted the other advertisers. The whole thing when Marin jumped in, et cetera, et cetera. But beyond that, they also handed out a bunch of free coffee. Uh, and, um, the march, uh, the march in Madison now ten years ago uh, against Scott Walker's uh, cutting. Well, uh, uh, the his anti union laws and also cutting the their version of. Um, I think they called it Badger Health. I think it's what they called it. Um, and the when I went out there to the roaster and had a conversation about the way that they deal with their growers, a lot of coffee companies, if their growers are having a tough year, they just go, buy, and they'll go buy from a different grower. Um, just Coffee started by, I think, the, the, the founders went down to Chiapas, and they did this as a way of supporting what was happening there with the coffee growers. And if one coffee grower has a bad year, they buy as much as they can from that person, that uh, entity, and support them. And if they've got to, you know, find a substitute uh, and they will, you know, do a blend. I mean, the, the point is they're in, in business as a co-op to help not only their workers, but to their, their suppliers, all fair trade just coffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY to get 10% off. Uh, Nomi is not going to be with us in the fun half. She is in Edinburgh. Wow. Well, that's nice. Yeah, for the Climate Summit. And so she's going to be... So the Climate Summit is happening in like, what, like a couple of weeks? Three weeks? Is it? Four weeks? And what happens is that's when all the, the, the sort of the governmental people come. But before that... There's all sorts of activists, NGOs, scientists. They all come and they do sort of the groundwork. And she's there interviewing all these people. That's so cool. So check it out. YouTube.com slash the Nomi Key Show. Nomi Key Show. Twitch.tv. Uh, Twitch.tv. Slash C. Underscore. No McKee. No McKee underscore show. Got to do something about that. Got to get it. Like the underscore thing always just, I don't get it. You don't like underscores? It just doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense. 
was I, I just want to understand was the no McKee show without underscores taken yeah like what <laughs> I was like Guy Lawson uh, we gotta have Guy on again but his like Twitter feed was something like Guy one two three four loss it's so, like weird I'm like what why is why'd you do that I don't know some people uh, arrive too late to the platform. To it's there. true, but even still, how many no McKee shows are there on Twitch? <laughs> Matt Leck, what's happening in the Matt Leckian media universe? Uh, yeah, on Wednesday, we are talking to Maximilian Alvarez of the Working People podcast. He's sort of like the studs turkle of the podcasting game, does a lot of interview with workers. Uh, had a really good one with um, meat processing workers uh, recently. We're having him on to talk about labor in this sort of like... Uh, final part, hopefully, of COVID, and uh, so that's uh, Patreon.com slash Left Reckoning. That's going to be at eight east or er, eight Eastern uh, on the YouTube channel. Go subscribe to that, folks. Thanks, folks. Six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty. See you in the fun half. You right. are in for it. All right, folks. Six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty. See you in the fun half. Oh, no. Oh, no. Are you ready? Oh, yeah. Wh who sent us this? <laughs> alpha males are back, 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 back. Boy is back. And the alpha males are back, back. Just as delicious as you could imagine. The alpha males are back, 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 back. Boy is back. And the alpha males are back. I just want to degrade the white man. Alpha males are back, back. I take all of it to my throat. Alpha males are back, 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 back. Snowflakes says what? The alpha males are back, 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 back. You are a madman. And the alpha males are back, back. Oh no, Sam Cedar, what a, wow, what a fucking nightmare. What a fucking nightmare. nightmare. Bring back the nightmare. 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 Yeah, or a couple of them, just put them in rotation. DJ Danner. Well, the problem with those is they're like 45 seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough for the break. That's fucking nonsense. You see white people doing drugs that look worse than normal white people, and all white people look disgusting. And the alpha males are psycho. Fuck them. Fuck them. Snowflake says what? 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 matter <laughs> have you tried doing an impression on a college campus I, I think that there's no reason why reasonable people across the divide can't all agree with this psych and the alpha males are back 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 and the africans are black 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 african and the alpha males are black 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 and the africans are back 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 when you see Donald Trump out there, doesn't a little part of you think that America deserves to be taken over by jihadists? Keeping it at 100. Can't knock the hustle. Come on! Fuck them. Fuck them. Things I do for the bigger game plan. By the way, it's my birthday! It's my birthday! Happy birthday to me, Jew boy! I have a thought experiment for you. And the alpha males are back. Back. Africans are black. Black. Alpha males are black. Black. Africans are back, back. Come on. <laughs> Come on. Blast. Come on. Someone needs to pay the price for blasphemy around here. I, 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 I am in total. Pussy, 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 pussy. Oh, I'm sorry. This is the music that we put on uh, for, see if we can get Emma. She comes back from break and see if she can actually. Uh... That's me. That's me propelling off a building. God, I can't.
can't wait until Saul's old enough to watch oh boy movies. <laughs> <laughs> he said to me the other day, he goes, do you know there's a new Bond movie coming out? And I'm like, you've never seen any Bond movie. And he goes, I know, but I've, I heard there's a new one coming out. It's a culture vulture. And I was like, yeah, well, and he's like, can I watch those? And I said, soon, soon, buddy. You're going to be so excited when he's interested in watching those and not Marvel movies. I mean, he knows, he knows that I have like an issue. Like we watched Black Widow. That was the last one we watched. And he knows I have a problem with like the, all the, the Thanos, you know, stuff ah, yes, like that. Thanos. Thanos. Um, and maybe, maybe I'm just sensitive because I'm so much like Thanos, uh, that, uh, <laughs> it, 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 you know, it's a little it's bit. Narcissism of small differences. <laughs> 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 Uh, this is, well, I don't want to read too much into this, but it's better than a, a poke in the eye. Uh, Manu Raju at CNN about an hour ago now uh, tweeted out, asked Pelosi if they'd have to drop any of the key pillars of their plan to reduce the price tag. This is the, this is the build back better. Beep, beep, beep. Beep, beep, beep plan. Beep, 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 beep. Uh, universal pre-K child tax credit, tuition-free community college, paid family leave, Medicare expansion, and she suggests that they will instead look at paring back the number of years. This is the smartest and most obvious play. Look, yesterday we played on the show the ad that the um, Medicare that the, the, the some Republican PAC put out about the the government, uh, you know, squeezing Medicare. And now, here's a photo of Joe Biden. And here's here's know. yeah, you can, you can look up on the web who the president is, <laughs> and then call him. Stop touching my Medicare. <laughs> but if your opponent in a two party system is running, claiming that you are squeezing Medicare. And you are the party which, relative to the other party, certainly, but maybe even in a vacuum in this instance, is seeking to protect or expand Medicare. It should be a tip-off to you that they don't want to be considered the party that is not doing those things yeah. to the point where they're actually outright lying. They've done this before. In 2010... After the, the, the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, one of the ways in which they raised money for that uh, Obamacare in the plan was they had found, and, they, they, and there was an awareness of this for, next, you know, for a while before this, but they decided to do something about it, that the Medicare Advantage plan, which is a supplemental plan within Medicare, that is more private that their reimbursement rates for healthcare providers were about 20% higher than they should be private insurers don't tend to uh, negotiate very hard because <laughs> why would they they it's it they make money off of like the sort of the the the, the volume of dollars that pass through them. Yeah. Because they have a markup, right? If I'm raising rates 18%, well, that, that, that's, that's actually just relative to their own markup. But, they, but there is a markup. And, 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 and we can see the dynamic within the context of the ACA now, 80% of their money that they take in from premiums has to go to, to paying uh, providers. So if you want to raise the actual dollar figure of that 20% that you keep for you, you pay more than you need to, <laughs> right? I mean, right. this is a basic, like, you know, if I'm doing a markup, if I'm a caterer and or I'm doing a, like, I'm, I'm an event planner and I get a 10% markup on every service I provide. You fudge the numbers. Well, no, I don't need to fudge the numbers. I get a, a more expensive caterer. Okay. Because if the caterer is charging twenty five hundred bucks, I put two fifty in my pocket. If they're charging five thousand bucks, I put five hundred in my pocket, and the work I'm doing is exactly the same. 
And so, uh, but, you know, in that instance, the, 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 the wedding person may say like, hey, I don't want the $5,000 caterer. And, and then everybody around uh, Sam says, you're cheap. No, that's, uh, I'm not talking about me. But, um, but in this instance, what do you, you know, uh, individuals aren't saying like, hey, this, 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 that's not what a CAT scan should cost me or whatever it is. Um, anyways, the, so the ACA cut back on those payments to providers by Medicare Advantage. No difference to the Medicare persi- uh, participants. It only hurt the providers, but the Republicans ran on the decrease of payments to Medicare Advantage, even though it didn't implicate the medical services that individuals received at all. And they ran on that cut, saying that Democrats were cutting Medicare. And they ran on that in 2010. They were hugely successful. That should be a hint to Democrats that... You want to get on the right side of the Medicare issue and you want to make it explicit. Yes. It's not, are we, uh, you know, defending it versus the lie that they're telling. It's we're coming out and we're expanding Medicare. We're expanding the benefits and we're expanding the people that are covered by it. They are afraid to do that because there's a separate constituency that they are worried about. I, I mean, explicitly, Nancy Pelosi is against it. Yes. She is against it. And and what's interesting, too, is that Build Back Better, all of the individual components in it, when you ask people in polling what they favor, sky-high approval ratings, sky high. including expanding Medicare. Build Back Better in and of itself pulls above water, but not necessarily super well. It's definitely a drop-off. And we've already covered how Biden's approval rating has tanked. Yep. There's an inability whether it be because of the Democrats' fears about pissing off those providers or health insurers or big pharma or whatever it is, or whether it's the fact that Biden has an inability or an unwillingness to communicate these kinds of issues. Um, There's a disconnect between what's in Build Back Better, which sounds convoluted and people think it's infrastructure when it's all these human elements, um, and, and the actual policies policies which are connecting with people well and part of it is too is that i mean let's be honest i mean it is to say the democrats in this instance you know joe manchin's a democrat bernie sanders is effectively a democrat um and they want very disparate things and the fact of the matter is is that i don't know what the breakdown within the democratic caucus is i think the vast majority are willing to sign on to uh, joe biden's 3.5 trillion dollar bill in fact the, the overwhelming majority would sign on to it in fact all of them would except for one or two at this point but nancy pelosi's disdain for an expansion of medicare while she doesn't articulate it operates as a um, that's a countervailing force and diminishes the amount of, of unified messaging that can take place. Um, she has, from the very beginning, wanted to make sure that expanding the applicants, the people that can subscribe to Medicare, dropping it down to 60, let's say, or 55, was off the table for her. And she doesn't come out and ta- say it too often. She says it enough. But um, it's there. It becomes a a drag uh, on the efforts to do so. Um, Heather Cargile, Cagle, Cagle, at uh, Political, polit- Politico. <laughs> I'm having one of those days, folks. Wow. Yeah, I know. I I, I said, I I, I miss said like four different things during uh, that interview. Uh, there's a lot of confusion, even among Hill Democrats, not just press, about how to read Pelosi's comments. Basically, I think what she's saying is they will do both. Yes, there'll be some big cuts, but they'll also pare back years on other programs, come in at a dollar target. That's, I mean... And yeah. then Drew Hamill, Pelosi's deputy chief of staff, uh, quoted to Heather and said, yes, that's what the speaker is saying here. So it's both. We're going to cut out some programs and we're going to cut back on the years of these programs and uh, leave it to um, 
There's a piece in the New York Times about what, who will get hurt with like these cuts, who are at the front lines here. Um, I mean, care workers, home care workers are some of the many people who will be hurt by these these cuts. Um, of course, now DACA recipients and uh, th that's already done. The parliamentarian has ruled on it and the parliamentarian is the queen, so we have to defer. But I mean, f I'm fine with cutting the number of years if it's the scalp that Manchin and Cinema need in order to say that they've cut down this dollar figure to this arbitrary amount. But damn, it's going to be a huge issue if we're significantly cutting some of these uh, programs. Right. I mean, substantively. You eliminating these programs or eliminating the proposals. What are we going to cut? Do? Paid leave? What are we going to cut? Child care subsidies? Are we going to cut those home care worker, that home care worker money? We're going to cut the climate change provisions? What are we going to cut here? in terms of the the substance of these proposals if you want to make it shorter i hate it but like that's kind of the price of doing business with these lunatics like mansion and cinema and gottheimer but maybe may i mean that that's the only route to go but i think that they're going to do both and i'm worried about what that means let's go to the phones calling from a 702 area code who's this where you calling from hey sam it's bro flamingo from las vegas bro flamingo from las vegas how are you sir um, all right, what's going on, guys? What's going on, Emma? What's going on? Hey, bro, Flamingo. Hey, uh, man, I've been wanting to get in and talk about a lot of things. Um, well, first, let me start with this one. Uh, the interview with Amanda Montel. I bought her book, by the way. I started it. It's really good. And uh, when you guys were talking about it, one of the first things that immediately came to mind was like the cult of white supremacy. You get what I'm saying? And I think... Uh, where you talk about cults and the beliefs that they held, the, 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 the beliefs that they hold, and the kind of the ideology that they espouse. I mean, don't get me wrong, there's definitely guys on the spectrum of white supremacy, but the core group, I mean, they're a cult. And I still think they hold a lot of sway in America. And the fact that it's not called a cult, I think, I, I don't, I mean, like, I guess you can't call it a cult, it's a movement, whatever, but you understand what I'm saying? Like, it's still fringe, though. And I, but, but a lot of these ideas, are, you know, suffused within society are not questioned. And I think, you know, and when she was talking about cults, I thought about white supremacy. And there's another thing I want to talk about, but if you guys have any, have any comments on that one, um, I just felt like, you know, that was the most obvious one to me. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know from a definition of cult if that, if that would... Um would would work i mean i think it's it's an uh, omnipresent ideology in our society i should also say that i did get a little bit of of pushback from um some people who work in the cult space this is unrelated to your comment uh, but it, it has yes, reminded sir. me that um that they dispute the idea that you that you cannot convince people of something that they have no interest in um, uh, I think uh, the guest had made the claim that you, you can't convince somebody unless they have a kernel of, of, of desire to believe something, um, that there is no uh, brainwashing. And, and some people have pointed out that there's actually some, some research that suggests the opposite. So I, I um, to be honest, I don't, I, I, I don't know. It is above my pay grade to make that assessment, but I, I, I should say that there are uh, that's a controversial statement to say that um, uh, you can't get people to do things that they w they were aren't inclined to do under the right circumstances. I think uh, the argument is that mm. that you can. I didn't but remember she made that argument. But. She did. She did. She did. And and again, like I um, I haven't uh, you know I, I I haven't dug into the research enough. I just know that there were people who pushed back, and I thought I'd mention that. Bro, what else do you got? All right, one more thing, and, I, and I'll jump. Um, also, speaking of like we're all right wing and cults and lunatics, there's another one. I think, I mean, we, we've talked about this before on the on the program, but there's just but there's another guy. He's uh, we're talking about the pickup kind of pickup artist, kind of dating coach, kind of. So to me, now they're all kind of versions of one and the same. Now you get what I'm saying? But mm -hmm. kind of peers like incels, the big toes. But there's a guy named Kevin Samuels, Sam, and uh, and I just want to put him on your radar because he's like this older gentleman, older black gentleman. Um. I think he's like, I believe like he's 50, so that might make him like, you know, younger boomer or whatever, but he gives dating advice to a lot of like, mainly black men, whatever. And, you know, he I just looked up his channel. Dating. It said the first video is, yeah. are modern women thieves? Question mark. Yes, exactly, exactly, exactly. 
this guy, so I'm putting on your radar. I'm going to point him at Matt Bender here. Shout out to Matt Bender. But I'm putting him on your radar because, Sam, like, a lot, I watch a lot of this content. And then be, be, because of the way, because, you know, of my my politics and, you know, what I read or whatever, I caught a lot of red flags. I mean, of course, of guys saying. Yeah, you, you see a red flag right. in that uh, question about whether modern women are thieves. No, 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 no. Yeah, we're just like, asking questions. Just asking questions. 1.2 million <laughs> subscribers. Right, but. Like for example, like for example, he said like he said wild things. Like for example, like he, he talked about Thomas Soul, and you should read Thomas Soul. And I'm like, wait a minute, Thomas Soul? Like really? But I mean, but he's giving dating advice to these to these men slash women or whatever, and he's bringing up Thomas Soul, and he talked about you know how when, when women entered the workforce, you know, it, 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 it drove uh, men's men's wages down, just all types of like lunatic stuff. Now we can sit here and laugh at it, right? Of course, right. right? To Emma, like, like Emma's pointed out, that's 1.2 million. Yeah. And 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 the kind of the kind of the format of the show, right? The kind of the format of the show. I'm sorry, guys, I'm gonna wrap it up real quick, but I think it's important. The format of the show: a woman would call in, and he basically a black woman generally will call in, and and and, and you know he has this kind of worldview where if you want a high value man over six figures, blah blah blah, you got to follow all these things, and submit to a man, ex- all this crazy stuff. But he has a huge following, and he's blown up. But there's just the reason why he's important, though, I, I keep an eye on him is because there's just so much right wing ideology, anti feminism, men, uh, women back in the workplace, all types of crazy conspiracies. I mean, and, and this guy is blowing up. And the, and the, and the last point, um, the last thing I'll, uh, I'll, you know, I'll jump, the thing that's really dangerous to me, because what I started picking up on, at first I was kind of like, you know, he's like, you know, just another one of these guys. He might be blowing up. His stars kind of cross, his star cross like all these others. However, though, I started noticing a lot of right wingers and white supremacists just subscribing to his channel because, again, he's berating black women and just women in general. Sure. But generally, black yeah. women and these guys would use and these guys would use the talking point. I just want to put them on your radar because I think. No, thank you, because it's it's a part of the right wing pipeline, yeah, right? I mean. No, this absolutely. is absolutely. I would uh, recommend uh, uh, Trevor Bolu of Champagne Sharks has done a, a couple, a two-part series exposing the manosphere. Uh, episode three twenty is part one, and I would really recommend people check out that because uh, it's exactly the same sort of thing. These sort of like cross-racial alliances for basically misogyny and mm. uh, oh, other sorts of right-wing right. ideas. That reminds me of something, um, uh, Bro Flamingo. Thank you for that. We'll check him out. Appreciate yeah, it. Wait, wait, Sam, 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 one last thing. Just, just the Matt's point. I'm sorry, guys. Real quick. Just the Matt's point, though. There's always an iteration of this. Every generation. I remember the POAs, the MGTOWs, the incels. Now it's this whole type of thing. It's always transforming. It's a right-wing pipeline. Take care, guys. Appreciate it. Uh, yes. 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 That point. Thank you. That point is absolutely. Um, is um that point is absolutely the case we, we should keep get seeing trevor on to talk about this yeah actually. that'd be a good idea yeah meanwhile here's an interesting story um a texas boogaloo boy you mean a left-wing uh uh ally well all right before you judge right about this texas boogaloo boy understand that this uh man Ivan Harrison Hunter, 24, was in Minneapolis um, protesting the killing of George Floyd. Um, So before you judge him because he's a boogaloo boy, okay, allow me to uh, read uh, from Yahoo News. Texas man pled guilty on September 30th to federal riot charge admitted he traveled to Minneapolis after George Floyd died to sow mayhem. Ivan Harrison Hunter, 24, admitted he traveled from the San Antonio area to Minneapolis after Floyd's death and fired 13 shots from an AK-47 style semi-automatic rifle into the Minneapolis Police Department's third precinct building on May 28, 2020. Footage taken that night shows Hunter in a skull mask, giving someone a high five after firing the shots and yelling justice for Floyd. Hunter admitted he traveled to Minneapolis to sow chaos during the protest following the George Floyd's death. He is a self-proclaimed member of Boogaloo Boys, Mm. a far-right anti-government extremist group. Members appeared at Black Lives Matter protests. Now just imagine if I was just to read... Members appeared at Black Lives Matter protests, and that just left it there. That's the only line I'm going to read of this. Boogalooers believe a second civil war known as the Boogaloo is imminent and will result in the overthrow of what they believe is a corrupt political system. Ah. 
the Boogaloo Generalized boys. Generalized corruption is uh, always a way for these like. Well, they want to take out the establishment. Yeah, I know, and the establishment is the liberal left that is dominating culture, and uh, they're going to do little operations to make it seem like the. The left is the one with the problem. They are known to exploit tensions and sow chaos in yeah. pursuit of further violence. Provocateur. Mm-hmm. Uh, after the protest, Hunter bragged on social media about his actions, saying he'd help the community burn down that police station in Minneapolis. He was actually the third Boogaloo boy to be charged in connection with Minneapolis protests. Um, it's probably just a Medicare for all action. An informant had also told the FBI that Hunter had admitted to a shooting at the building and helping to set it on fire. He was charged with participating in the uh, riot there. I mean, it seems sometimes like they have an alternative, uh, I mean, an alternate uh, alternative motive. That's what I was exactly. looking for, right? Yes. So That's perhaps point. we shouldn't take their uh, proclamations of allegiance to leftist ideology or different uh, ideas and, and proposals as a warm welcome to make sure that they become a part of our movement. They're probably not operating in good faith. I'm just a shot in the dark. No different agenda. Yeah. Different agenda huh. at the end of the day. Um, yeah, I mean, the chances are um, they're either A, you know, one of these racists that's trying to provoke some sort of fantastical civil war, B, a fed uh trying to yeah. uh, provoke and trap leftists into doing something stupid and put, throwing them uh, in prison for an extended period of time or i think a very far remote possibility is see they're just confused people that are actually trying to help in other uh news here is a former trump advisor i mean he, this is one of those things like we're going to play this clip and talk about why this is still happening this is uh, former Trump advisor Sebastian Gorka oh. with former Trump attorney Jenna Ellis. Jenna Ellis was one of those like um, Sydney, what's her face? Sydney Powell, Powell type. Type. Smartest yes. legal mind. And uh, she was going on. To, they, they, like, you ask yourself, like, why are they pushing this stolen election thing still? Like even more fervently. There's a recount, another audit happening in Wisconsin now. None of these things have worked out for them. The Arizona uh, audit showed that Trump lost by more than they originally said. But then Yet, that means that there were discrepancies, so there can be discrepancies elsewhere. I mean, that actually is exactly... Uh, well, that's what they're banking on. You yes. have Kimberly Guffoyle coming out on TV this morning and saying they should audit all 50 states. And, 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 but, and, and so, well, let's play this and let's talk about why they're doing it. We know already that the election results in at least five of the swing states were irredeemably compromised. So we already have sufficient evidence for these states to decertify their electoral uh, results. And so what this means is that the state legislatures would pass a resolution through both chambers that essentially say that the Secretary of State's certification that was sent to Congress was based on false or faulty information. And that then would trigger uh, kind of a chain reaction because then if at least three states do that and Joe Biden's electoral count drops b below the requisite 270 count, then Congress is going to have to deal with that. Decertification is incredibly important for the record and to make sure that we are dealing with uh, every legal vote counting and counting accurately. The whole nature of this now, and there's a story I think about a an election official in Georgia in a county that uh, Trump won, who's been driven out of her job. And this is happening all across the country. The difference is that they are looking at these states. They, the, you know, most of these states, generally the states that end up the pivot states for the election, generally are the same. There are, I don't know, six or seven states you could pick. And that will, those six or seven states, you can almost be sure, will dictate the next, like, three or four or five national elections. And what they're doing is they are purging. They are purging the election officials 
who actually did these audits and recounts and found, like in Georgia, for instance, they're getting rid of these people so that the next time when they do the same thing, mm -hmm. there are not the same obstacles. Yeah. That's what's going on here. It's sorting. Yeah. It is sorting. And that's the A side of it. The B side is that they're going to recruit people to fill those positions. Well, well, yeah, of course. They're 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 eliminate they're they're replacing these people with pro Trump people, with people who are absolutely convinced they're either disingenuous or not, it doesn't matter, but they are convinced that it's not possible for a Donald Trump or for a Republican to lose, and therefore they work backwards in terms of the counting of the votes that way. And so the next time around, all of this stuff is going to be put into a, you know, normal legal framework mm -hmm. so that there won't be any controversy because no election official is going to stand up and go like, actually, no, the vote was fine. And Adam Tooze makes a point in his uh, COVID book, which is like, Let's say a Bernie Sanders style candidate wins this, then all of this is even prepared for when they actually need to do it uh, versus, say, a president like Joe Biden, which they probably wouldn't keep their powder dry. Yeah. And that's why, you know, we, we touched on this in the Boogaloo Boy segment about this like amorphous elites and going after those types as being nefarious and operating behind the scenes without accountability. That's why the right sees that as a useful narrative right now, because it allows them to undercut like verifiable facts and election results and constantly audit and constantly undercut. And they have this micro project of what you say, which is like such a great point of trying to replace these people who live in the realm of reality with the, with the MAGA heads, but the macro project is undercut all verifiable information in order to make our cohort not trust anybody or anything except us um and we've seen that gone international now you've got uh jared bolsonaro's son wearing project veritas shirts and right. this is going to be a right-wing international uh agenda that netanyahu's kid really that too Okay, but still, I mean, like, this is just, just something to watch out for, not just in the United States. Meanwhile, earlier in the program, we played the uh, Foxes, the Five, claiming that the Southwest Airlines um, flight cancellations were a function of vaccine mandates. That is, of course, you know, the talking points uh, on Fox this week. But here is... Um, Tucker Carlson last night giving a little uh, monologue in response to the news of the Southwest Airlines cancellations. That would be the world's longest detour. And for a moment in the chaos, it became clear that Joe Biden is not the only person in this country who has power. It turns out there is a limit to how far you can push some Americans. So in that way, it might have been cast as an inspiring story, man against the machine. But the media had no interest in telling that story. In fact, some on the corporate left suggested the Southwest pilots had somehow committed what is known as an illegal job action, illegally not showing up for work, as if politicians have a right to force Americans to labor against their will. Now, some of us had assumed that was a condition we would recognize as the... Pause for one second. Pause for one second. Pause for one second. Uh, didn't we just cut a bunch of unemployment benefits in order to do just that? And Tucker Carlson was cheering for it from the sidelines. But Without a doubt. But he to be fair... compelling labor. To be fair, I don't know if you saw his uh, piece on the coal miners... Uh, from Alabama, yeah, that's who have been uh, striking, mm. or the nurses in Buffalo or Worcester or in California who have been workers. striking, or the Kellogg's yeah, workers see, or yeah. the Frito-Lay workers or the teachers who have been protesting. I mean, this is the point, right? Like, he doesn't care about the power of labor. He doesn't care about the rights of people to withhold their labor. No, no. What he cares about is um, promoting vaccine. We're just asking questions. And the answer to that question is, 
ratings go higher. That's what the answer to the all the vaccine questions are. Ratings go higher. Clicks go higher. Doesn't matter if you're on YouTube or on Fox. They know exactly every time they do a story that in any way frames vaccinations, frames mandates, frames masks as being some type of like authoritarian play. It it cycles back onto vaccine um, uh, skepticism and it raises their viewership. Well, yeah, and it's like the, the major message they like to send is libs are hypocrites. They don't actually care about what they yes. say they care about, which is they, they do the exact same thing about free speech issues. So we have to like worry about if criticizing uh, Dave Chappelle is a massive uh, violation of freedom of speech, whereas <laughs> like the Netflix employee that gets uh, suspended for saying like, uh, hey, I have some problems with that. Um, um, we're never going to hear about that. Yeah. Like it's it's the dogs that don't bark because the only the only time they ever care about talking about this stuff is if the real message of liberals are hypocrites. They don't actually care about these things. Can be the uh, sort of subtext. And it's the same. And it's this in the same the vein. Uh, using using labor law and like laborers' rights and and and. Uh, using that i guess in, in the um context of this like monologue here is the same thing he does with his anti-war stuff but anti-intervention stuff um he you know he uses that as, as a useful rhetorical trick in order to get people uh aligned with his like far, far right fascist views all right I'll continue with this as if politicians have a right to force Americans to labor against their will. Now, some of us had assumed that was a condition we would recognize as the textbook definition of slavery, but no, it's illegal not to work, they told us. And then at least one outlet described what the pilots had done as, quote, domestic terrorism. Get to work immediately, wage earner, or you're Al-Qaeda. There were more cancellations at Southwest Airlines today. No doubt there will be more to come, and not just of airline flights. At least two Amtrak train routes in the Northeast were canceled over the weekend, and so was a regularly scheduled car ferry in Washington State out to the San Juan Islands. In all cases, the employees in question, who have been told to get the shot, did not show up. Were these also protests against the Biden shot mandates? We can't say for certain. No, it we certainly can't. wouldn't surprise us, Ooh. because that's our future. Thousands and thousands of Americans, the best among us in many cases, we can't say for certain, but that's what we think here. Is that really what you think there? I'm so shocked to hear that. It's interesting he couched it there because uh, the, as we mentioned earlier in the program, there is zero evidence. And in fact, the, he's, he's talking about labor rights as the Southwest airline own like labor union is saying this is not because of vaccine mandates. On top of which we know that October is on track to be the second worst month for pilot fatigue since August. There was no vaccine mandate in August, which was a record. Tucker's like, the, yeah, we like if you're mad at the what's going on with labor, then listen to their complaints. Yes. Southwest Airlines is overworking them so that their profit margin is higher so that their stock value is up. If you are care about labor rights, rights of Americans in the workplace, then you've got to be talking about Southwest as a corporation, but you also got to be talking about we need to shore up labor rights in this country. Tucker's like, the left wants to compel you to work, and I want to compel you to overwork until you're completely exhausted. Well, and also, <laughs> like, th this whole thing about teachers have to um, teach kids even if they're not wearing masks. That's Is that slavery now, too? Or where is the right. consistency in right. terms of, of like, course. making work under which conditions? Of course. That's a great point. Of course. He doesn't care about labor rights. I mean, come on. They folks. care about, like, labor shortages because Tucker wants someone to, like, make his martini. 
um and they're framing it as, and in a way that's obscuring like sam said the real labor issues of our time right now which is all these other places there's a massive strike wave going on with like the Kellogg stuff the massive stuff. and and including like demands that could be made by these workers themselves but instead it's being uh, um collapsed into the rights culture war narrative and i think anybody that thinks that this is actually helpful for workers or wants to pretend that oh look at the right is actually for workers i think um is uh, Mark, how could how could let me do this? How could a program that has three million viewers nightly promote labor power by talking about strikes? I don't know. We don't know here. Yeah, we're just asking we don't questions. Know. We don't know. No one has told us. Yeah, give me a break. As I, and and then just we go back to the 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 pandemic times in 2020, um, not the pandemic times in 2021, when Tucker Carlson was constantly talking about how we have to get people back to work. We have to get people back to work, and now he is against compulsory yeah. actions to encourage people to get back to work, so that all of the workers are safe, as opposed to he wants only right. compulsory work when you're unsafe well let's address like the whole uh, you're not standing up for ex basketball or worker rights when you say ex basketball players should be able to like play games <laughs> unvaccinated what you're saying is that person is so important and such a special um flower that we they can actually disregard um, um the mandates can put everybody in danger and that's what we're supporting what so about the, the rights left? of all the other exactly. basketball players like, not to have somebody who could be um walking around with covid right playing like, basketball with them the idea that the left is somehow hypocritical for like not indulging um basically spoiled assholes is I think ludicrous. Speaking of spoiled assholes, hmm. Charlie Kirk and his <laughs> his ongoing endeavor to become the next Rush Limbaugh, and he very well may be, um, is <laughs> I, I well. I wonder if he can get the same Doctor Feelgood. Taking exactly, he'll need it at one point. Well, he might already have the connection. <laughs> <laughs> he's always sniffing oh he's well that could just be it's just a doctor who won't issue like uh antihistamines um Good here point. is um charlie kirk responding to chuck schumer's um remarks about the way that the republicans are playing around with the debt ceiling and i think these comments from chuck schumer are important because i want every republican out there to realize that when the Democrats are winning, they are rubbing it in our face. And some Democrat senators, some Republican senators are now coming up and they are stunned. How dare he do this? You think we're still living in the same country, don't you? Senators from South Dakota, Senator Portman, you think we're still living in the 1980s where the Democrats actually want what's best for America? <laughs> the Democrats want to destroy the country. We know this. This is not new stuff. It's not profound thinking. They want to see America completely obliterated, the Constitution shredded and remade in their own San Francisco, Brooklyn, Malibu, Manhattan image. Where there is no cultural identity, where you live in sexual anarchy, <laughs> property is a thing of the past, Damn. and the ruling class controls everything. We know this. And Schumer is willing. Oh, pause it for one second. There. Hold on for a second. He's saying that the there, we're going to live in what was the four things he said? Uh, go back. Where what there's no it? cultural identity. No cultural identity. Sexual anarchy. Remade in their own. No San property Francisco, rights. Brooklyn, Malibu. Was it Manhattan. those three Manhattan things? Manhattan image. That sounds it, lovely. Wait, it was San Francisco, Malibu, Manhattan. No, but what was Brooklyn. the three things that he said were going to happen? We have no cultural identity sexual anarchy and no property rights and it's all going to be controlled by the elite well, what are they going to control at that point i mean if we're it's sexual anarchy there's they decidedly no control on our sexual i'm not sure what that yeah, means. yeah right. they don't have they don't have property rights for even themselves there's no property rights <laughs> uh guess what that is the number one method of control by the elite in this country is property rights Yep. There is Undefeated. no, I, like, I don't even know if there's a number two at that point. Law. Right? By I, the property owners. By Law by the property owners to protect property. Right. 
I mean, how much of our carceral state is a function of property rights? How much of the lack of access afforded to Americans uh, by, uh, for, for medical care, for food, for housing, is a function of property rights? If you want the elite to have less power, the first thing you should do is abolish property rights. And then the second thing should be sexual anarchy. Oh, yeah, obviously. Yeah, Chuck Schumer, when I look at him, I think that guy wants everyone having sex out in public. Well, I want everybody a... to have uh, put your, you know, put your sexual glasses. anarchy. Yeah. It's pandemonium over Listen, by Prospect Park. It's, it, it's, uh, we're going to have sexual anarchy, and I think we'll be good. That means no um, sort of, I guess, BDSM, because you can't clearly define the... Uh... The, the sort of roles like that. Yes. Right. Uh, yeah. Chuck Schumer constantly wants to stuck safe in words. the middle of being a switch. Yeah. <laughs> Chuck Schumer, no more safe words. No more safe words. He wants to abolish property rights from the tippy top of his Brooklyn high rise. There he you lives. go. Yeah. We're going to abolish safe words. You know who this is, though, who Charlie Kirk is um, basically covering? Um, the, the hits of, and I only know this because he followed me and had to block him recently, but Richard Spencer, this is mm. what Richard Spencer says about like, oh, these people, they don't get it. They're so far behind. It's all over. That's like the Richard Spencer song. Oh, right, right. Well, of the Republicans. Exactly. Oh, yes. No, but this is also, I mean, Mark Levin, Sean Hannity on his radio show. I mean, this is uh, Laura Ingram. This is what Limbaugh always did. This is what Limbaugh always did. What? It was, uh, oh, sorry. Go on. It, 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 I mean, it's, it is, it's, an effective, it's an effective tool to not alienate your uh, listeners to the policies of the Republican Party. It's just an effective tool. What is the flip side <laughs> of sexual anarchy? Ryan Cole just called and said the Baileys just called. Uh, just I am the Baileys just called. They're totally into sexual anarchy. <laughs> I spoke to the Baileys. <laughs> totally free love. They're both ethically non-monogamous and unethically non-monogamous. <laughs> and gender fluid. That's what we're doing right after we abolish the property. No more property rights. No more property rights in San Francisco, <laughs> Brooklyn, Malibu, and Manhattan? Right. There you go. What? The rents are too damn low at that point. Are you kidding me? <laughs> the rents are gone. So, yeah, the sexual anarchy. Yeah, no property rights. man. God. You're going to be able to have sex wherever you want now because there's no property rights. <laughs> Why do you sound like Joe Pesci a little? I don't know. I just I, I never listen when Schumer speaks, so I don't know what he sounds like. Call him from a 301 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hello? Hello? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, yes. uh, okay, whoa, 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 whoa. Back off your phone a little bit. You're getting a little bit excited, getting very distorted. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Oh, my name is Sharif. I'm calling from uh, like Mayo, Maryland. Okay, that's good. You you have calibrated your voice. What's up, Sharif? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah have, okay, uh, hold on. you got to back off your phone a little bit because I can't, we can't take your call. If Too this loud. It's like... Sharif, he hung up. All right. Sorry about that, but it's just, it would be unpleasant for everyone. Let's try this one. A 937 area code. Who is this? Where are you calling from? Oh, hi. This is Justin from uh, Ohio. Justin from Ohio. What's on your mind? Well, I want to complain about a fucking Ohio Republicans. Like, I'm sorry. Ohio Republicans for a second. Man. And I got a question at the end here. Wait, I'm sorry. I don't know what's going on with uh, people's phones today, but I can't understand what you're saying. You, you have a question at the end of Republican Ohio? What? Oh, sorry. Uh, I just have a question about, um, let me explain here. Why, what, what can uh, people that don't like the Ohio GOP really do in the future to vote them out, to, like, mobilize voters? 
Well, I mean, there's a bunch of things you can do um, that range from, you know, joining your local Democratic Party to joining your local DSA to, you know, they won't necessarily explicitly, um, you know, campaign or work against Republicans per se. I know it's generally not the idea, but you will increase, um, you know, solidarity and support for issues that the, the Republicans uh, generally campaign against. Um, I mean, we, you know, I don't know, letters to the other, talk to your neighbors. Um, I mean, I, and both those things can happen concurrently, too, or, yeah, all those things. Yeah, it just seems almost inevitable to have a Mandel or Vance or one of these senators is going to take over the Portland spot, and they're just, I, I don't really like them at all. Well, I would say that... Um, assuming that it's inevitable is probably the most likely thing to make it inevitable. It could very well be inevitable, but my, my, uh, I would say to you, if you're looking for my advice on how to get rid of Republicans is to believe that you can, uh, and, and then work from there. All right. Thank you. I was just wondering. All right. Appreciate the call. Yeah. yeah. No if that's inevitable, then, um, get working with an organization to like basically doc, uh, knock doors for whatever the next inevitable thing uh, yep. is. Calling from a 773 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Uh, hello, is this me? It is you. Who's this? Uh, this is uh, Jay from Chicago. Jay from Chicago. What's on your mind? Uh, so uh, I'm not sure. Well, I just wanted to start off saying uh, I love the show. I've been a daily listener for a while now, uh, or a couple couple months. Thank uh, you. So you guys have definitely changed my politics a lot. Or oh, not great. changed it, but I guess made me uh, more aware of politics because I'm uh, I'm 26 years old. How did you come to uh, hear about the show? Uh, I came to learn about it from uh, um, from the H3 H3 thing with uh, the whole Stephen Crowder thing. Nice. God, I love Ethan. <laughs> yeah, he's he's awesome. And uh, ironically, you know, back in college, I used to like. Uh, be it like a Stephen Crowder and a Jordan Peterson washer and stuff like that. So I've definitely taken a huge shift in that regard. That's um, awesome. And that's that's called yeah. evolution. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I hope more people, you know, evolve in that direction moving forward. Indeed. Uh, so my question: uh, So on the south side of Chicago, um, they're opening a presidential center uh, dedicated to uh, Barack Obama. Yeah. And uh, and I. You know, when I was younger, I remember, you know, very, you know, proudly. Well, I mean, I was like super young at the time. I was like, you know, like a teenager. I was like super young. Uh, and I remember I was like super excited about Obama. I remember the first time he ran. I stayed up until midnight watching the poll results, you know, and I guess, you know, kind of as a kid, that's kind of unique. Uh, yes, but now, we had a very you know, that, similar experience, I would say. Yeah, yeah. I, I was like, for sure. Yeah, I stayed up all night, you know, watching the election results and I was yeah. super excited. Um, and, uh, and I guess I, now that I'm more aware of politics, and I'm aware of like the things he's done advancing the drone programs and, you know, with the Kudu's hospital airstrike and the way he kind of just like paid people the pulse for some of the money as if that would excuse anything he's done. Uh, <clears throat> I guess, I guess, uh, I kind of, what, what was the second thing you said? I'm sorry. What was the second thing you said? Oh, the, the, the Kudu's hospital airstrike that happened. Oh, okay. 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 Yes. Uh, and um, I was just, uh, I suppose, uh, going to ask what like you guys think. Uh, this is your collective mind together is definitely far more knowledgeable than me. Uh, what do you think the uh, best and most articulate way to, I suppose, uh, protest and, I suppose, bring more attention uh, to the things Obama has done that the media doesn't coverage on my grand opening day? Because uh, I'm sure, um, you know, it's going to be praised as like a wonderful thing they're doing. Uh, well, you know, ignoring the gentrification that it's going to do to the area and right. push the loans on families around there. Well, I was going to suggest, yeah. yeah, focusing on that angle, like within the context of the the mm -hmm. uh, library, I think you can probably make a lot of your points when you're focusing on what it's going to do to Chicago. Um, and it makes it contextual. I, I, right. I, I have another take on that. Um, I mean, I think like the, 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 the point, I mean, the question is, is like, you know, what, what, in, what, 
What increases our understanding about uh, Obama's legacy and what's important to know about that for future politics? There is no, I, I mean, I'm not in any way refuting, you know, his loc you know, the location of his uh, library and, and the, the, the effects it has there. I mean, to be honest, I don't know the neighborhood enough to know, you know, the, the dynamics. Um, and I have to say that Obama is actually, I think, like even a worse, his legacy is even worse with what he's been doing, uh, I you know, as a former president, frankly, in my opinion. But it was the drone strikes. It was the edification of that program uh, to assassinate assassinate American citizens. It was the failure to account for torture. It was the, um, in, in my estimation, in terms of immiserating Americans, it was his decision about uh, the way that they would respond to the financial crisis by essentially bailing out the banks and saying, you guys, uh, now that we've bailed you out, will you help out the homeowners? Um, his desire to cut Social Security his uh, failure to leverage the uh, sunsetting of the, the Bush taxes, the, um, his respectability politics, um, and, uh, and the PPP, for that matter, um, uh, or the TPP, I should say. And the, the question is, is like, how do you make people uh, more jaundiced towards his perspective and uh, towards his politics and, and look into it? I think, you know, I don't know. I don't know how much there is that you can do, but a, a sign that says like uh, <laughs> Barack Obama made it legal to assassinate Americans by drone. Not a bad sign. Um, you know, uh, Barack Obama paved the way for Donald Trump is also not a bad sign, frankly, because you got to remember who your audience is here. There's a lot of people, the vast majority of people, still have a very uncritical perspective on Barack Obama. You also can just, and, as Sam says, make it, make it clear you're on the left. Like when you say he led to Donald Trump, you're not alienating the very people that you might want to bring over to your side. The, I, 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 as, I, as I say it, like the uh, Barack Obama opened the door to Donald Trump is a, is a good way to get people who might be more reluctant to be critical of Barack Obama to, to reorient and, 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 and reevaluate him. I mean, it's important from a historical sense. It's important for, you know, the next Barack Obama who comes along for people to have um, to have a, a more critical eye. You weren't alone in that. Uh, you know, I think that largely the country was was very, you know, it was just like uh, what he said change was going to be was a little bit different than I think some people interpreted change. But I would also uh, mention what Adolph Reed uh, wrote about Obama in 1996, um, where he basically, in Chicago for the first week. 96? 1996 for the Village Voice. In Chicago, mm -hmm. for instance, we've gotten a foretaste of the new breed of foundation-hatched black communita communitarian voices. I mean, this obviously has to be calibrated to who your audience is. Uh, one of them, a smooth Harvard lawyer with impeccable do-good credentials and vacuous to repressive neoliberal politics, has won a state senate seat on the base, mainly in the liberal foundation and development worlds. His fundamentally bootstrap line was softened by a patina of rhetoric anyway that's about obama and that's in 96 um and it was a very good called shot <laughs> yep uh yeah, yeah i was like uh oh, sorry uh, i was just uh, considering like that yeah like what you were saying just kind of like getting a really solid slogan and then perhaps like underneath that slogan on the picket like getting like a qr code and just i guess loading that qr code up with like articles and like essentially well that's a good idea well i mean i would start fun. i would start i would start with um you know sort of the banking stuff and the cutting social security i don't know but you start whatever you want on that list but i think i think um barack obama you know gave us donald trump with the qr code is a good way to get people who are um who are you who you want to reach appreciate the call good luck with it and uh, let us know how that works out appreciate Thank it bye-bye yep oh, that's an encouraging story yeah. That guy. Hey, speaking about, uh, I just want to play this clip to just draw people's attention that um, there is, I think, um, I believe there are four factories 
where Kellogg's workers are striking across the country. One of them is in Michigan. I can't remember off the top of my head where the other three uh, are. Maybe somebody can look that up for us. Yeah. But let's play this uh, clip of, um, we're not going to play the whole thing. This is from uh, Saturday of this week. Last, last week. Th- this past Saturday. Um, it's a video from More Perfect Union of uh, some of the Kellogg factory workers. We feed all these families, but I can't feed mine. You know, best friend died. Yeah, sorry, not my problem. That's yours. We got cereal to make. We work seven days a week. We are literally scheduled seven days a week. For any time that someone would feel sick or whatever, they want you to use your vacation days as opposed to having sick days. And again, in working excess of 120 days in a row. 400 million dollars in profit on cereal alone is not something you can walk in and tell us we're going to give you less for. If you don't be here, you get a point. If you get a point, you can get suspended. You know what I mean? So we got no choice. You have to be here. But it's just killing us. You know, you can't even now go in there and tell them that your aunt passed away and you need a day off to tell you to call in or use a vacation day. So in order for me to get a day off, someone else is working 16 hours. Very often, we don't even know that we have to work 16 hours until 10 minutes before it's time to go home. If you have dogs, if you have kids you have to pick up from school, if you have other obligations, I hope you have somebody to call because you have to stay. They could tell me at 1045, Heather, you're forced over, you have to stay. So then I'll work that next shift. At 6.30 a.m., I can go home. But then my regularly scheduled shift is starts at 2.30 the next day. So there's eight hours off in between and that's, uh, that according to them is plenty. All right, um, um, you know, the cost of living. You guys can see the full video at More Perfect Union. They've been doing a great job covering a lot of these. We'll put a link to that, too, in our YouTube and uh, podcast description. But the uh, the strikers are striking in Omaha, Nebraska, Battle Creek, Michigan. Those are the folks from there. That's where the headquarters of Kellogg uh, is as well. A, Kel- a Kellogg company is as well. Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and Memphis, Tennessee. So if you're in one of those uh, cities... Head down, support the the strikers. I don't know. Go down there, bring them a pizza. Honk. I wonder now that uh, Tucker Carlson has this labor desk, if he's going to be covering this at all, or if he, if uh, they'd have to make this about mask mandates to get some. Yeah. Right. Right. Exactly. But 1,400 workers, that's uh, significant. And um, it, the Kellogg employs 31,000 uh, people globally. But... Um, in the United States, I imagine that makes a significant, significant dent. So it's um, solidarity, as we say. Go bring them a pizza. Yeah. Um, Matt Walsh is really, really going in overdrive today or these days. He supposedly rented an apartment in uh, what was it in Loudoun County? Virginia because he wanted to weigh in on the transgender bathrooms or something like that. I don't know exactly what the story is. Hmm. People can find it. I mean, it, it does feel like um, a guy who may be at the Daily Wire and they may have said, like, look, we've looked at your numbers and they're not very good. Um, so if you, uh, you're on special probation and then he's like well darn it i better kick this in higher gear yeah they're like you seem to think this being massively unpleasant thing can really work and you got about a couple months to do that so he had to go out and try to find people in virginia that might be able right. to pull into you take it to the road you better you up. better amp this up find yeah. your people um here he is going after all those <laughs> all those people who are outraged this is he's appealing to the crowd that's outraged by the reporting of the extinction of several species of animals mm. and of uh, vegetation. Um, incidentally, almost I, I, just about every animal plays a role 
in an ecosystem. When you Shut were in up, elementary school, you it. probably learned that ecosystems, every species in some way adds to the um, vitality of an ecosystem. And, and by vitality, I mean literally its ability to sustain itself. Have a green juice, you hippie scum. <laughs> Here is Matt Walsh. Uh, going after all of those tree hugger hippie scums. Well, yeah, I don't know what we're gonna do without the uh, the Bachman's warbler. That's a great, isn't that? That's a great tragedy. The Bachman's warbler isn't gonna be joining us on Earth anymore. I, I'm sorry. I, who cares? Who cares? I, why does it? Who cares that these species are going extinct? What do we need them for? Pause it for one second. Pause this, it for one this second. One... This is like back in the um, the late '90s in comedy. There was this really horrible uh, tick that some hacky comedians had, where they would like wear something stupid, like a weird, you know, like green green suit, yeah. and then get on stage and go, "I know what you're thinking," you know. Like, why does this guy look like a lime or something? And it's like, well, dude, you wore the suit. Like, you know, like it's not funny because you wore the suit. You Isn't can't... that like a little bit similar to not dissimilar from Dave Rubin just going on stage and being like, I'm gay. That's a sort of, a sort of. <laughs> but Walsh here is talking about like, who cares? Yeah. I don't know. Why are you talking about it? You do. <laughs> you can. You know, this is this is a classic. Like, I doubt there's been many um, uh, uh, people who are even aware of the extinction of species. But he's, you think that like we shouldn't even record the extinction of species? Like, it's not relevant at all this to is our like existence. The basic like enlightenment sort of. Uh, pursuit of cataloging the god's creatures for instance like, yeah exactly like, like this is like back. basic basic human civilization stuff like let's be aware of the world that we live in but rush limbaugh taught us all that we are supposed to make fun of uh people who support owls or whatever it is and so uh, i will follow the playbook and, and, and hope that i get clicked i had no like liberal family members growing up except one uncle who lived in dc who was constantly made fun of because he had an issue with uh, wolves going extinct that was my uh, exposure to left and then all of a sudden like 20 years later people are like why do we have so much deer <laughs> Why can't we, like, why is the deer ruining our crops? It's because God wants you to shoot them. Here's Matt Walsh. Who cares? Who cares? I, why does it, who cares that these species are going extinct? What do we need them for? This, this, this one version of a woodpecker isn't going to be around anymore. Oh, okay. Well, there's other woodpeckers around that can fill their place, I'm sure. Is that all they, can, is they can pick up the woodpecker baton. I can't really pick it up, because you know. But metaphorically speaking, I just don't understand. And, and if we're told that, that climate change is gonna is gonna kill us all, then why are we trying to keep other species around that are em emitting, you know, with, with their carbon emissions? It adds up. So should we should we be celebrating this, kind of thinning the herd a little bit? I don't know. But, but for climate change and environmentalists, they want to thin the herd among people, not among the Bachman's warbler. Uh -huh. Or the uh, or the ivory-headed well, woodpecker. Makes... Um, that's what they want to do. So when, when they hear for these, this is how twisted these people. I know when I say oh, I don't care if these species are going extinct, it, it, you know, people hear that and they're horrified by it. It sounds like I'm some sort of sociopath, mm. and maybe I am. Yes. Yeah. But consider <laughs> the fact that for a lot of other people, no, this is not if, true. When they hear about human populations declining, they're uh, happy about that. Positive. They're more upset about. Let's imagine that there's a, a population of people, say, uh, fleeing weather conditions caused by climate change at, for instance, a border. And uh, what does Matt Walsh think? Should we not allow them through, or should we allow them through? Oh no, he cares about the people. He doesn't want them diminished. Um, I mean, I like. <laughs> what about the it's one thing supporting also vaccine mandates to help people? Uh, prevent them from dying. I don't know if that fits squarely into his narrative there. But I also like the equation of like, 
just population trends versus extinction of species. But I, w I do credit where credit's due. It was a lot of self-reflection that went into his questioning and maybe saying, maybe I am a sociopath. Yeah, it sounds like I'm a sociopath. Maybe I am. It's That's something you might want to unpack. Dude. And I don't think he gets how ecologies work if he thinks that people's theory is let's eliminate as many species as, as we can and therefore that will uh, cut down on greenhouse gas emissions ecological austerity <laughs> yeah what is he in I mean, it down. honestly honestly though what's fascinating is you do have these uh, these uh, environmental fascists on the right but that's what I'm I trying mean, to that say. Guy they're who projecting. Shot up, they're projecting. That guy who shot up uh, people in uh, in in Texas, at the mall or at the wall uh, Walmart, or wherever it was, um, that was his manifesto. We've got to thin the herd with people. This is coming from the right, incidentally. Tucker Carlson's been dancing around this for a while now. They're going to try to f funnel the generalized anxiety about climate change into their depopulation or overpopulation narratives. Um, and it's going to be about keeping certain people out and not yeah. helping certain people and what? helping other people. I can't wait for that moment where Matt Walsh, um, you know, is questioning whether he's a sociopath and, and, and suddenly says, you know, my theory about getting rid of the species uh, in diminishing climate change, maybe we should just extend that to like non-Americans. It's just amazing that any conservative can read that. Like the idea that we're just upset about a single woodpecker. Right. Like, is that all that happened? Yeah. Just one woodpecker. Because if, that, if that's all that's been going on is we lost a woodpecker in the last like 50 years. I actually, that's actually really good news for me. It's, and it's right. not. It's not. Um, Shoot. Yeah. Unfortunately, sorry to break it to you. Do you remember as ki as a kid, either Bradley or, or or Matt? Sorry about this, but the discussion of best. Do you think I wasn't a kid? Yeah, one, well, or is uh, that was just like. Well, because this happened, I think, when we were kids, the extinction of the dodo bird. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I remember that having like a profound impact on me and being very sad about the dodo bird. I think, yeah, like I mean, look at what we've done to buffalo populations in this country, yes. for instance, like uh, uh, um, in the Northeast. The passenger pigeons like the amount of animal life that not even just like recent capitalism but like in the past 300 years that we've just um destroyed it sucks and it's it sucks to learn about and miss but these are the same guys though they're gonna go like uh pull a donald donald trump jr and ride on the back of an suv and shoot a lion to death and then pose with it they're like that's the kind of sociopath they are <laughs> But they they don't they don't see so sociopathy necessarily as a terrible <laughs> as a terrible way to be because they're of the Ayn Randian school and so that's that's you know I don't know. One more clip. Um, Michael Flynn is on the outs apparently with the Q people, the QAnon people, right? Because what was it that he did? I thought he was just at that Q conference. No, he said some sort of like um, prayer that. Q people associate with Satanism. Oh, okay. okay. And so he's One had to come out to publicly do. and tell everybody that he is not a Satanist. He was doing it ironically. Was he? I'm not. Oh, no, no. I, I mean, he seemed pretty earnest in saying, like, I'm not a Satanist. Please. You, you folks, you folks are my meal ticket. I'm not a Satanist. Here is uh, Michael Flynn on with Tucker Carlson and Tucker Carlson's, um, you know, Shant, you know, shanty set. Uh, I don't know where he's got this thing. Has he set this thing up in uh, in New York City? Uh, incidentally, anybody who knows anything about uh, Tucker's studio up in Maine or his studio down in Florida or his studio in uh, New York, I know we got uh, people at Fox who listen to the show or watch the show. Email us at majorityreporters at gmail.com. Uh, happily, we'll... Um, and if you, if you want to do it uh, privately, you can email us and just say, like, hey, that thing that you asked for, I want to, uh, you know, maybe we can do this on a private channel and we'll send you something like uh, to do that. But always curious about those things. Meanwhile, here's uh, Tucker Carlson on his Fox Nation show with uh, Gerald Flynn. And um, <laughs> this is actually 
this is sort of funny because Flynn is like sort of touching on something that's sort of real. There is a uh, national security state. And then Tucker is like, uh, that doesn't fit into my narrative enough. Let me just tweak that for you. We have two separate governments. We have the one that actually gets elected and goes into office. And then you have a government inside of Washington, D.C. that operates under no rules, uh, no authorities other than their own or who's ever in charge of their Sounds own. Sounds like that government was still controlled by Barack Obama. Yeah, and, and I would say ah. that that's, that uh, to a degree is, is what we're operating with today. Yeah. So this long standing, back. long standing national security state, maybe he's talking about, or maybe he's just talking about the bureaucracy of what you civil mean like, servants. What you mean, like generals? <laughs> like those things that aren't right. elected that are there but exactly each uh, administration yeah. exactly. controls the General policy. Right. Flynn. Right. Now, somehow Barack Obama was able to fire General Flynn. <laughs> but I have no doubt there's a longstanding national security apparatus that... Um, His brother is still the commander of the Pacific. Right. And a whole bunch of those McChrystal guys are still there. Like, so the, yeah, the deep state's still alive and kicking folks. Yeah, he, right. know, he knows But that, that was all shit. Barack Obama. Barack Obama yeah. wasn't rolled by them. Barack Obama is still control, pulling the strings. Yeah. So that there's a Satanist cabal that's drinking the blood of children. Like, that's what, again, this is Tucker Carlson using real language about the national security of blob, about the CIA, as you say, for his own agenda, which is to kind of tip his hat to the Q people by having Flynn on. And, and, and by, by making it about Obama as opposed to a structural problem uh, with what Eisenhower said, uh, you know, 60, 70 years ago. Because um, that's the that's that problem. But Barack Obama was just uh, not even born at the time that that was becoming a bigger problem. Folks, we are done with the call in portion of our show. Apologies. Uh, have... I just saw the I am that the dodo bird went extinct in the 1600s. <laughs> mm. I, 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 thought... I was going to say, I think we learned about it at that time but it yeah. was like a while ago that it happened Emma has so, like, <laughs> i'm always playing up how young i am because i'm during... actually 720 years Vampire. old yeah, it was right. during the english civil war <laughs> <laughs> all right let's take some ians and then get out of here laura what do you think about russell brandt i used to like him but he seems mm. to have joined the spiritual guru yoga crowd of anti-vaxxers when he says to do your own research i wonder if he's reading medical journals uh, russell's putting people's lives in danger and we can't uh meditate away COVID. yeah it's, it's a bummer i'm actually going to talk about russell uh on left reckoning this week um i think his heart's in the right place but his ears are in the wrong place to uh, keep it short yeah, I, I, I got to be honest, I don't, I just don't follow him that much. I mean, I just, I know that, like, I know that ilk of people, and um, they, you know, they are prone to um, uh, skepticism, which is, I think, a good thing, but sometimes they, particularly when you get that successful, you are surrounded by people who will not articulate skepticism to you. <laughs> and so you are basically just sort of wandering um, untethered and without anybody who's willing to come to you and say, hey, hey, dude, um, just you should listen to this. Like what you're talking about is nonsense. Here's why. There's a lot of people around him who will not say that to him because um, he's their mail ticket or or just because you know uh, fame is is intoxicating and intimidating and um and also when you get that famous uh a lot of times you know it's impossible to to, to believe that you could be flawed in your thinking he's and so also you don't in the like podcasts like uh Zeitgeist. Zeitgeist. So it, there's a little bit of a, a Rogan overlap with some of his audience. That's it. Yeah. It's a lot of like, because he, he was, I used to listen to his BBC radio shows and he was not sort of like as footsy with Jordan Peterson types and stuff like that. And you see like yeah. when you have to play to these sorts of audiences, it's, um, a, a, it's much more, you're getting a lot more hits talking to Candace Owens than you are you, any communist. You want to talk about the big lie. The big lie has always been that somehow 
independent YouTube podcasters, whatever you want to call them, are less inhibited by ratings than, uh, you know, network television or cable television. This is not a defense of cable television. I, I, I honestly, I, I watch probably less than most of the people who, even, who are even hearing my words right now of uh, cable television. Cable news anyways. But the fact of the matter is, is you have a podcast and you have a YouTube channel. You are intimately aware of how many views, how many clicks you're getting. Not, you know, like in cable television, they wait 24 hours to see what, you know, what, what holds people over the 15 minute thing. And that definitely, definitely implicates what they're going to cover. People are bored by the report on Social Security. They're going to make it about, uh, you know, something that, well, I mean, on the on the right, it'll be about vaccine hesitancy. You know, on the, the nominal left, it will be, you know, I don't know, anti-Trump something. And that's the way it works in cable, in cable news. But all you need to do is go look at, let's say, Jimmy Dore's uh, channel and get a sense of what's getting him clicks. And it's, it's the vaccine skepticism like if you were an expert at vaccines you wouldn't put out as many youtube videos about vaccine uh, about vaccines as he does and it's also counter programming it's like the exact reason why some of these youtube channels got big in the first place like as people were feeling disenchanted with cable television you're saying something that's counter to the dominant narrative and people are going to seek that out and so there's an audience there yeah and and and, and that's exactly what you know, so-called vaccine skepticism. But this guy, you know, that's why, they, and, and don't think that even if you believe that someone like Russell Brand has more integrity than uh, a, a Jimmy Dore, let's say. Yeah, I think he does. Uh, which he very well may. Don't discount the fact that he's still a guy who's a performer, who's a comedian, who's, uh, you know, a, a, a podcaster or whatever. You want response mm -hmm. yeah do you think uh, Chappelle has done uh, so much trans material because the punchlines have just been that great this is too good great well, for attention I mean I think he he genuinely is like sees it as some type of ideological battle but yeah, yeah. along with the like cancel culture stuff I think he's like I almost I don't know I don't want I don't want it's not the I haven't seen that that, that special yet I probably won't uh, all right, we got a couple more here. Uh, Andrew, Andrew, Andrew K. Sam, in the big fall, when you're a character, when your character gets shot through the window, was that you or a stuntman? It was a stuntman. Wow. Yep. Sorry to sorry to break Snowflake. your. But uh, I've been meaning to show that to Saul because he told he told me about like that kind of glass the other day, and he's like, and I'm like, I I got shot through a window like that, but it was actually a stuntman. Ah. Uh, Jersey Max, my unvaxxed cousin lives with my 90-year-old old vax grandmother, and now they're both positive for COVID. Oh. How should I handle this with my cousin? I need to get him to realize that his actions affect other people. Also hoping my grandmother's okay. She says into, only has a cold for now. Look into monoclonal antibodies, right? Yep. That's, yeah, if you have the ability to. Um, for I don't know. If your cousin doesn't get it now, I don't know what will make him get it. Michael Tracy fan, Sam, yesterday you said you sent Saul to camp. As a Jew going to camp, hmm, I wonder if it was Saul and helping him focus or so. Okay. Uh, let's see. Sink, what? Sink machine. Um, Matt Walsh is a sink, machine, uh, a sink mansion's yacht. Matt Walsh is just doing Bill Bird jokes poorly. <laughs> Chappelle is still mad he hasn't written anything as good as Rocks Bring the Pain. Um Ban Don Gino. Inflation fears are a powerful talking point for the right to justify cutting spending, but under the framework of modern monetary theory, taxation is a powerful tool for reducing demand-side inflation. Democrats and the left should be bolstering the case for taxing the rich with the anti-inflation benefits. I mean, I would agree with that, but I would not concede the point that what we're seeing is demand-side inflation. There's no evidence that demand has gone up particularly. It is just that the prevailing level of demand is not being met by the screwed up supply system. 
Now, maybe that calls for austerity, which is what that would be. Um, and I'm certainly not against. In fact, I'm quite for taxing people. Um, I mean, at least at 400,000 above, but I would tax people uh, more at, you know, closer to 250, frankly, or 200. But be that as it may, I don't know that you want to concede that this is a demand, um, an, a, a demand driven inflation. This is the world's supply uh, lines being completely effed by COVID. And that's not going to change. <laughs> I mean, that's not, I just don't think it's going to drive prices down because what we're not seeing is, is, a, is an increase in demand. What we're seeing is a dramatic decrease in supply. And the cost to supply those things is still going to be high. It doesn't matter if it's one person or five people that want this thing. I don't think that's what's driving this. I think what's driving it is literally there's no drivers for, for, for trucks in multiple countries around the world. There's no, there's a story of like, uh, I can't remember where it is. A, um, the second or third biggest port in this state, I mean, in this country. And they've got all these like shipping containers sitting on the, the docks full of stuff. They got boats lined up in the ocean and they can't get it off their docks. Stuff is mismatched. I mean, there's all sorts of problems. And I don't, I don't think severe, um, because that's what it would have to be. Austerity is going to, um, is going to change that. Can I say something quickly about this Gruden story before we, because I want them to be on the record really quick before yes. we go. So, guys. Uh, Shoot, I don't have that thing on my Yeah, uh, the sports thing. Yeah. So, How about John Gruden had. <laughs> John Gruden, former head coach of the Raiders, out yesterday, last night, late. On Friday, it came out that he had made a disparaging racial comment about the executive director of the NFLPA and his being a black man. It was a racist comment about his appearance. And then yesterday, late last night, a spattering of other emails when he hadn't resigned came out. Now, I just want people to understand this story isn't just about John Gruden. Pay attention that this is a part of the NFL owners protecting themselves. The, this is a part of a larger investigation into Dan Snyder and the Washington football team's misconduct. And there is a trove of over 600,000 emails where these were carefully plucked from because he did a variety of other things, went after Eric Reed for kneeling, called uh, the commissioner a gay slur, which is probably why he's out of there. Also, he make, has made zero friends in the league. But there is a larger story here, and it is a way to deflect from and sacrifice a coach so that the owners don't necessarily get the scrutiny because the 32 owners run this league, and they were fine with cherry-picking and getting this guy out of there. So that becomes the story, not the fact that this investigation concluded over July 4th weekend was buried over the weekend. The NFL hasn't publicly talked about what happened there. And there are owners who are scared shitless that their emails are going to be gone through. And this is a part of, I think, a larger racial reckoning and sexual harassment awakening in the league. And so I'm calling on the audience, if you're a sports fan at all, don't let this story of Gruden be the only story because this is the owners covering their own ass. So who, ha who has control of these emails? The NFL's internal investigation. So the NFL, I think, because one... He's leaking stuff. He, yeah, they're leaking stuff. They wanted Gruden as a scalp. Um, and so... I want all that stuff. I want to see all those emails. The point is, release all of those 650,000 emails. We want to see Dan Snyder... I think is responsible for this because he doesn't want, he's one of the worst people in professional sports owners as well. He doesn't want his ass out there and all of the things that he participated in. Why are we getting the only one side of these emails that Gruden had, not with Bruce Allen, the president of the team or with the owner himself? Because the owners who run the league and vote on these things don't want 
this precedent being set that their internal communications and their settlements can come out against them and force them to sell the team. This is a, a bigger systemic problem, and I just want people to pay attention. She's on the record, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. You've heard it here first. We will follow this in yes, the future. All right, uh, so. we've got three minutes here. Uh, fart in mouth. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Happy Halloween, or as the kids are calling it, H. Ween. Isaac, uh, all right, now I'm not going to, uh, oh, darn. Uh, it's clear I don't get what you libs don't get. Critical race theory, vaccines, Bill Gates, Greta Thunberg. Uh, therefore, we need a strong white Christian man to force people to be free. Grand Depression uh, Party, or, oh, we did that already. Rob from Dedham, can we get a show far for the friggin' socks? Reaching the ALCS. This team is wicked awesome on Marathon Monday with a walk-off. Are you friggin' kidding me? You got it. <laughs> Without a doubt, dude. Damien, did you talk about what the Spurs coach said about Columbus Day? We did not, but we will maybe soon. Prior Fire Kowalski, uh, Sam, MR Crew, the only true leftist is the vegan Vig. Big cold front moving in, bringing much needed rain to the Great Plains and even the first snow of the season to the Rockies. This will slow harvest for a day or so, but we're still around for the five year season average. Prices have been dropping lately, which is expected. Now the grain supplies are rising. Though prices are still higher than any time under the Trump administration, the biggest thing helping farmers right now might be food stamps. It's the only factor from last year that is different and large enough to make an impact on this large, as far as I can see it, and I'm only looking forward to seeing studies on it. Left is poggers. The great auk went extinct about 200 years ago, so the equivalent uh, northern hemisphere basically lost their equivalent of the penguin, and it was due to human hunting. Who cares? The death cult is real. Uh, three more. Penny from New Mexico. This issue of what lengths Republicans are going to go to repress votes and steal elections is why I asked a few weeks back how you and Digby could talk about voter turnout without doing so with this much of a backdrop. Seems we must always talk about this backdrop whenever talking about any f aspect of future polls, elections and voter turnout. Uh, fair enough. Anita Boner. OK. When Sam said speaking of. OK. <laughs> Train boy. Barack Obama legacy is Donald Trump's presidency. Pure and simple. Mm. Oh, that's pretty good. All right, three more. Illuminati kids. Right-wingers only care about species going extinct if they affect their hobbies or have an industry around them. I notice a fair bit of right-wing support for stopping invasive Asian carp because it goes after the bass population, for example. Exactly. No more fly fishing. I-5. Conservatives always piss and moan about the dying culture and the threats to all Western civilization by Matt Walsh's logic. All that should be allowed to die because who cares? And the final I am of the day. Emma, say five words about the Ravens. Go. Lamar Jackson is whatever. I'm not doing five words. Lamar Jackson is a stud, 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 stud. And this is why him and Josh Allen were the two best quarterbacks coming out in that draft. And I said it at the time and I'm right now. And I was right about Tua not being a good quarterback and Justin Herbert being better than him coming out. Boom. End the show. See you tomorrow. Bye. <laughs> it might take all the strength I got to get to where I want but I know Somehow I'm gonna get there I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and